ठीक है ये तो बंद हो रहा है श्री गुरुभ्यो नम सभा नम सुप्रभातम वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू वी आर इन द सेकेंड डे ऑफ अवर नेशनल सिंपोजियम आयुर्धारा द आयुर्वेदा कंटिन्यूम एन इनिशिएटिव बै द सेंटर ऑफ एक्सलेंस फॉर इंडियन नॉलेज सिसम्स ई टी खरगपुर विद नॉलेज पार्टनर्स स्कूल ऑफ मेडिकल सैंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी ई टी खरगपुर डॉक्टर बी सी राय मल्टी स्पेशलिटी मेडिकल रिसर्च सेंटर ई टी खरगपुर अंडर द एजिस ऑफ धारा एंड अकाम आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव सेक्रेटेरिएट मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ कल्चर गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया एंड मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एजुकेशन ए आई सी टी आई के एस डिविजन ऑफ ए आई सी टी एंड धारा लेट अस स्टार्ट टूडे सेशन विद मंगलाचरण मधुवाता मधुक्षर सिंधव मध्वीर्न सतोषधी मधुनक्त मुतोषि मधुमत्थिव गुम्रज मधुद्यौरस्तु निता मधुमांदो वनस्पतिर्मधुमागुमस्तु सूर्य मध्वीर्गा ओं स्वस्ती Uh, in this morning session we have uh, uh, three plenary sessions the first session is on the therapeutic dimensions of endangered medical plants uh, by D dr madhu gupta uh, head of the department of dravya guna uh, medicinal plant pharmacology ipga er kolkata uh, first invite all the three speakers of uh, today's morning session uh, professor madhu gupta uh, i invite you to the dais uh, professor somesh kumar department of mathematics of iit kharkar please uh, i request you to please come on the stage uh, and dr swarnendu bag uh, assistant professor csir institute of genomics and integrative biology new delhi Uh, first let's let me introduce the first speaker of today's session professor madhu gupta uh, dr madhu gupta is a professor and head of the department of dravya guna uh, medicinal plant and pharmacal uh, plant pharmacology in uh, she is the principal institute of post graduate ayurvedic education and research uh, she has contributed a lot of work related to ayurveda medic medical plant pharmacology and she has published many research papers in peer reviewed journals she has played a mo monumental role in establishing the uh, the state of the art uh, this state of the art herbal garden at the heart of kolkata the garden scientifically manages the cultivation of over 300 plus indian medical medicinal herbs shrubs and trees in addition Uh, to that uh, the garden has a moder modern classroom for students a small medical uh, medicinal plant library and herbarium to assist students and researchers working in medicinal plants this unique garden is unparalleled in india and is currently the best of its kind in the entire country many other research projects are going on under her guidance i request uh, professor madhu gupta to deliver her lecture i think you can go down because you cannot see no which should be down ah yes we'll be down okay which one 
very good morning and namaste to all of you and first of all thanks to the announcer and he has explained a lot of my research experience very nicely thank you sir and i also thanks to the organizing committee they have selected my name as a speaker related to the therapeutic dimensions of the endangered medicinal plants no sir you have not mentioned the time sir please let me know the time is 20 minutes okay sir now first of all as for the ayurveda system of medicine because i belong to the field of the ayurveda the meaning of the ayurveda is everyone knows about the knowledge 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 and what the knowledge that the knowledge is ayu kama manan dharmarth sukh sadhanam ayurveda iti uchyate that is the definition of the ayurveda how to cure how to provide the longevity and how to prevention and the curative of the disease depends upon the ahar and bihar dincharya ritucharya each and everything is directly related to the prevention and the curative of the disease as mentioned into the ancient literature into the charak and the shushut and as per the we know about the plants we know about the plants because plants uh, lots of plants is in the lakhs 4 to 5 lakhs of the plants are into the year as per the gymnosperms and the angiosperms but uh, the those plants as per the ayurveda system of medicine medicines those plants which are having the properties and which properties are responsible for the karmas that is the yatrasita gun karanam tat dravyam that means the those plants which are having the potent properties which in the in the we can explain in the uh, ayurvedic in the modern terms having the secondary metabolites a chemical constituents which are directly related to the prevention and the curative of the disease are called dravyas and which is can be used as a medicine as a oshud and the for the oshud that's it is the very important subjects they have already told for the chikitsa there is a four parts that they have in four types of the things are the very related bhisak dravyan upasthata rogi pad chatushtam that is the bhisak one is chikitsak chikitsak and the bhisak dravyan means the oshud bina oshud chhala kono jinish ta korte hi parbe na seta jinish the oshud is a very important and the rogi je rogi ta apni chikitsa korben and next is a apnar sevak that is the attendant is also required so this is the terminology which is the used for the ayurveda system of medicines and in the ayurveda system of medicine the three types of the medicines are the used first is the herbal medicine second is the mineral medicine third is the animal product this is the single uh, types of the medicine we can also use in the combined formulations as the herbal herbal mineral polyherbal and the herbal mineral and the animal products now the subject has come to what is the importance of the endangered plants because in the we are using the lots of the medicinal plants into the kitchen as a kitchen into the as a spices as a food as a ahar and the bihar but now the government of india has established the har ghar har din ayurveda why what is the importance of this subjects that's means because in the routine we are seeing the lots of the plants are going to the endangered so this slide is showing that this is the importance of this plants now this is the they have already explained this is the herbal gardens which has been prepared with the collaboration of the hitco and the department of the health and family welfare government of west bengals and they have given the land and the government has is given the fund and it has been prepared by the institute under supervision of my the this is the, the in the three acre land and the well planned and the well systematically arranged uh, having the very clear labels of the you can find out the detail of this plants and the more than 300 plants are there it has been already explained 
now the what is the just for the i am touching for that because this is the normal slides we everyone knows about the india is a proven of the herbal medicines and the medicinal plants more than 7 7000 medicinal plants are having the therapeutic properties which has been used in the ayurveda sister ayurveda yunani siddha and the other homeopathic system of medicine and most of the 15% of the medicinal plants which has been used by the modern scientist to isolate the compound and for the curative aspects of the disease now that's why the government of department has also initiated the we have to uh prepared the herbal garden in the each dispensary why is a herbal garden importance of the each dispensary because we are seeing the lots of medicinal plants are going to the endangered here if we can find out in the rural uh, rural areas that is the 75% of the population depends upon uh, medicinal plants and they are using in the different ways as per the ayurveda system of the medicine we are providing specifically if the patients can take the fresh juice jaise tulsi ka hai basak hai and the other plants hai that's we if the person can used into the fresh juice that is the very more potent than the other Uh, pharmaceuticals doses and after that in the powder form and after that we are providing into the quartz decoction form and the asa and the aris different types of the pharmaceutical doses we are providing now this is the slide i have already explained the endangered species are those that are the currently are at risk for becoming ex extinct within the foreseeable future throughout all or a significant portion of their range which wild threatening species and are defined as those as the risk for becoming endangered due to the two main reasons loss of habitat and loss of genetic variation including this is the very important habitat loss and the degradation genetic and the reproductive isolation suppression of natural events environmental contaminations over harvesting and excess is trade and the climate changes these are the main causative factors where the plants are going to the endangered into the most of the uh, jungles most of the forests and the and the other places now what are the factors which are responsible for to find out the raw herbal materials these are the important factor this is the intrinsic factor that may be the genetic loading extinction factor due to the environmental collection method is also important cultivation is also important harvesting is important post harvesting processing transport and storage and adulteration which is also we should have to find out to provide the raw herbal medicine for the quality control now this subject is a how to prevent the endangered and threatened species there are the some parameters which are required for the cultivations of the plants that is the very importance the cultivation methods of the medicinal plants can provide the wide spread use of the alternative medicines preference for the natural products chemicals and the botanicals in herbs dwindling forest cover and the reduced supplies from the natural habitats availability of the markets national and the international availability of the high yielding varieties availability of the agro technologists and the availability of the processing technologies and the profitable returns for the sustainable basis this is the importance of the and the benefits of the cultivations of the plants now the this slide is showing the iucn red list threatened categories they have already sub categorized the endangered species into the so many ways on the basis of their availability and on the basis of their climates on the basis of their um, on the basis of their diversity botanical diversity of the plant so these are the ex is the extinct extinct in the wild reasonable extinct some plants are the reasonably other some plants are found into the other state but the reasonably which are more potent and the more uh, used by the people which is the reasonably extinct critically endangered endangered vulnerable nearly threatened 
least concern and the doubt data deficient. These are the reported data of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They have estimated the 13.49 of the world vascular plants. That means the more than the Thelex species, totally about the 40,000 species are the undervaring degree of threat. And that is the previously I have explained to you. The main, uh, many plant species are becoming extinct, just like the 123 are the extinct and 32 are extinct in the wild. Under threatened categories, 3,325. And these are the different uh, uh, numbers which have been included into the different subcategories of the plants. Now here I am showing you the some, some plants which are mentioned into the critically endangered. And uh, these plants, some plants we are using at the Ayurveda system of medicine and the some plants we are using but the some species which are going to the endangered where they can be used as a substitute of these plants. That is the Aconitum casmenthus, Acularia malescensis. These are the number of species which has been given, Tribulosis rajasthensis and Crotularia species and Curcuma indura, Curcuma longa nagirguma indura. These are the name of these species. I am not explaining, I will explain only the some important medicinal plants which are going, which are already extinct and the going to be extinct after this slide. This is the endangered plants species. This plant, this is under the vulnerable is going to be the extent of them so many factors. And now here is a some near threatened plants. Albizia, we are using the Albizia series gas we are using, but nowadays for the environmental conditions and the most of the peoples are cutting these plants and these plants going to be extinct. But the Elvisia in the Arveda is a very uh, good medicine which are, we are using as a different, uh, system, a different system of medicine and curative aspects. This is the least concerned and the name of these uh, so many plants we they have mentioned into this. Data deficient, this is also the data deficient. Abrus, abrus precarious we are using uh, for the um, abdominal pain and the rejuvenator. But now the abrus fruticulus is also the going to be, there is a no this type of the data collection or yeah, information occurred into the IUCN. Now these are the, just I have collected the some medicinal plants which are mostly used for the different varieties of the different formulation of the Ayurveda system of medicine. These plants are the Sausuriya Lapa, that's called the Coast Picroriza, Jinko Bailova, Schwersia Chiraita, Gymnema Silvestris, Tinoispora Cordifolia, Seleca Oblonga, Holoestema, Celestus Paniculata, Orogylum Indicum, Glyceriza Glabra, Tylophora Indica, Bacopa Monirai, and the Raulfolia Serpentina. Now I will show what is this plant, this is the plants, you can show that this is the Sausuriya Lapa. In the Arveda, we are using as a kust and this plant is a perennial herbs and mostly found into the Himalayan region. We have seen the most of the plants which are found into the Himalayan region and the high attitudes which are mostly going to be the endangered due to the cutting of the forest, no cultivations. That is the main cause of this uh, endangered species. So this is a very important plant and we are using the roots of the plants belongs to the Asteraceae family. And the roots, uh, roots are the use having the uh, chemical compounds are the cyanopicrinine, dehydrocostus and the germicinine and the lepidilactone which is mostly used particularly in the complexion, easing, worm infestation, headache, epilepsy, cold, cough, and the fever, uh, inflammation, and the also using as the aphrodisiac drug, uh, those which are having the sexual problem, we are using this drug. And the pharmacological, the hepatoprotective, hypoglycemic, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, gastroprotective, and antiviral, etc. Now this plant is a very common, this plant we are using a lot of in the preparation of the abdominal discomfort and having the abdominal discomfort, that is the we know, uh, you have already heard this plant, this is the Picrorhizia curro plants. And this plant is belong to the Plantagenesi family and known as the Katuki, it is a very bitter in taste, just like the Kalmyk, 
Kalmeg is also the bitter in taste. It is also the bitter in taste, mostly found in the China, Pakistan, India, Bhutan, and the Nepal, and mostly used for the fever, asthma, joint disease, anemia, abdominal pain, dysentery, cold, and this. And due to the presence of the, these chemical compounds are the kutkin and the kutkosides, picrosides A, and the different glycosides, iridoids, glycosides, which are responsible for the pharmacological activities like the hepatoprotective, antimicrobial, anti-mutagenic, cardioprotective, anti-malarial, anti-diabetic, anti-cancer, and anti-inflammatory activities. Now, this plant is uh, not mentioned into the Arveda system of medicine, but it is used into the going to the endangered. This is the Jinko biloba plants, belong to the Jinko AC families, known as the Jinko or the silver fruit. It is a very big tree, and mostly this plant is originated from the China, the first use in the medicinal property in ancient China. The China took the Jinko for its the claim cognitive definite cognitive benefits and to elevate symptoms of the asthma. This is the also used for the strengthening properties. Contain mainly the terpenoids, glycosides, and the other flavonoidic compounds, ginkoloids and the bilobidrates. Uh, These are responsible for to provide the increased sexual energy, soothing bladder irritation, and the treating intestinal worms and the treating gonorrhea. Now this plant is also known about the, I have already some, previously explained the Andrographis paniculata kalmeg, which is also the bitter and the Swercia chiraita plants. This is belongs to the Gentiaceae family known as the chiraita, which we are using the whole plants we are using in the different uh, formulations. And it is the annual and the annual herbs. The whole plant is widely used for the treatment of the hepatitis, inflammation, and the digestive disorders, fever, malaria, anemia, bronchial asthma, worms, and epilepsy. Due to the presence of the iridoids and the saccharides, and the other compounds such as the chiratin and the ophelia acid, palmitic acid, and oleic acid. And the pharmacological activities are the enthalmentis, hepatoprotective, hypoglycemic, anti-malarial, anti-fungal, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory and anti diarrhea And these plants are not available, but the in absence of these plants, we are some of the companies, they are putting the Calmec. We know the endography paniculata, which are also having the similar type of the Ayurvedic properties. Now, this is the also a Gurmar. Gurmar is a Gymnema sylvestris plant, more potent for the having the anti-diabetic activities belongs to the Aposinaceae family and Sanskrit name is a Mesh Shrangi and it is the woody climbing plants and leaves are the opposite in shape which are already shown into the previous slides and for used for the treatment of the uh, anti-diabetic as a in the Prameroke into the diabetes, arthritis, anemia, osteoporosis, hypercholesteremia, cardiopathy, asthma, constipation and also act as an anti-inflammatory. But it renders the glucose lowering activity due to the presence of the phytochemicals, the stigmesterol and the triterpenoid saponin. That is called the gymnemic acid is responsible for the anti-diabetic activity. Besides this, the other pharmacological activities are the immunomodulatory, anti-cancer, antioxidant, hepatoprotective, weight loss, uh, and uh, gastroprotective activities were reported. Now, this is the, in Ayurveda, it has been mentioned for the Jyotishmati. Jyotishmati, I think uh, uh, you people are known about the Medhi Rasayan, different types of the Rasayan which are responsible to pro strengthen the body into the brain or into the uh, body. So, this is the Jyotishmati plant. It is also known as the Celestus paniculatus. Celestasi families, known as the Jyotishmati, it is the, yes, well, I will finish it. And this plant is also contains the main celestrin, paniculatin, silafagin. These are the important alkaloids which is responsible for the having the property of the beta, thermogenic, emollient, stimulant, intellect, promoting digestive and the digestive activities. 
and the pharmacological activities are reported as a neurotropic and the neurotropic rejuvenative activity, cardiovascular activity, anti-inflammatory, anti-fertility, antioxidant activity, which are mentioned as a uh, reported in the Ayurveda and the modern science. Now, this is the very common plants. Everybody knows about the, uh, this is the gulanch. And Tinospora cordifolia is a many spermacy family and the guduchi. It is the, um, uh, mostly found into the West Bengal, but in the other state, it is uh, going to be endangered species. And the stem is used, specific character is having the rosette-like structure on the stem. And main uh, presence due to the berberian alkaloids, and which is responsible for the anti-diabetic, anti-cancer, immunomodulatory, antioxidants. We are also prescribed these medicines for the as a fresh juice or the powder form for the provide the immunity into the those patients which are having the cold cough and the respiratory discomfort and the diabetes for using into to, for the long term. Now this is the Glyceriza glabra. So, um, everybody knows about the uh, Hindi mein Yasti Madhu bolte hai, Bengali is the Jasti Madhu. That is the very important plant, but this is not easily available. It is also found into the high attitude in the Himalayan region, and it is the herbaceous perennial herbs known as a Jasti Madhu. And the fresh licorice roots are used, having the bright yellowish brown color. That is the identification of the mark of these plants. And having the flavonoids, main compound is the flavonoidic compounds and the glycinizic compounds. And if you can find out the roots contain the glycerizing a substance that is the 50 times sweeter than the sucrose, that is the that's why this drug should be prescribed for the should be prescribed during the time of the diabetes patients and the, also the hypertensive patients. We uh, it should have reduced the some side effects and the some the toxic effects for the patients. Now this is the very commonly found plant. It is a climbing plant. It is called the anthmul, which is used for the mainly used for the uh, for the treatment of the asthma. That is the respiratory disease. There are two types of the anthmul and the ananthmul. Anthmul is a sariva. That's a hemidesmus indicus. But this is the anthmul. It is also the climbing plant, Tylophora indica, which is mostly used for the asthma disease. And now this plant we are known as a, in the different different places having the different names. But this is the Brahmi plant, Bacopa monirai. But we are using as a food, as a sabji, as a chutney in the form of the uh, food. But it is a very important plant, but not easily found in the some uh, places of the India. That is also the going to be the endangered plants. And that is belongs to the Scrophrolisi family. And mostly which is used for the memory enhancing properties and also having the warmth manifestation disease and to provide the also the abdominal discomfort as, act as a hepatoprotective and the rejuvenator. This plant is also used as the for the mental strengthening as a medhirasayan. Now we know about the Sarpaganda because the first uh, drug was uh, evaluated for the treatment of the hypertension is a Sarpaganda Raulfilia serpentina and belongs to the Aposinaceae family and mainly compound which depends upon the Reserpin, Reserpinine, Serpigine, Serpigine to used mostly for the hypertension or mental stress including the mental disease, the schizophrenia and the bipolar disease, epilepsy and the seizures and the sleep disturbance. We are using the Raulfilia serpentiza under the, it should be prescribed under the supervision of the physicians. And this is the very important plant because uh, everybody knows about the Dasmula Rist, Dasmula the Quath, that I, I am going to come. This is the Orogylum indicum plants and it is almost endangered plants. We are not getting these plants and substitute are using. The smaller risk, we are using the so many disease. So this is a very important plantation is also required. And here is a Celestia oblonga, Celestia oblonga, Celestasi family. This is also the going to be endangered plants and mostly found into the uh, Himalayan regions. Now, if you last one, this is the Holostema adequate that is also called the Ark Pushpi is a Jivanti. It is a main Jivanti. And what are the other other names of the Jivanti is also the Leptodinia reticulata. And also known as the Ark Pushpi due to having the 
uh, I think everybody knows they have seen the arc means the calotropis procedure and flowers are the look like the arc pushpi. That's when the, this plant is mostly used for the as a jivanti, as a rejuvenator, aphrodite acid, and due to the presence of the tannic acid, steroidals and the alkaloids compounds. Now, thank you everybody for listening this uh, very fast uh, lectures. And I think I have tried to explain the some plants which are very important. And uh, we should have to do the some, uh, uh, to, to, the collect, to start the collections into the, as for the government of India has already declared the 16 medicinal plants we have cultivated around the, just, just like the kitchen garden just like the spice garden and we have also good the medicinal plant garden is the nearby for, for the for the long term for the rejuvenator act as a medicinal plants act as a rejuvenator thank you everybody sorry for taking the time. Uh, we thank professor mridu gupta for enhancing our understanding about the medicinal plants uh, now i request dr Amrita Choudhury, ma'am, uh, to kindly felicitate uh, Professor Amrita Gupta. We know that mathematics plays a critical and exceptional role uh, among all the uh, branches of science. And uh, mathematics is in the rare uh, background of uh, all the established statements of science. Uh, uh, Ayurveda is science of life, whereas mathematics is language of science. So now let us see how the language of science meets the science of life. Uh, and my, uh, I invite uh, Professor Somesh Kumar from Department of uh, Professor of uh, Department of Mathematics, IIT Kharagpur. Um, sir, please. Uh, Professor Somesh Kumar has research in, uh, interests in the area of statistical decision theory and inference. He has published more than 200 research papers in refereed, reputed international journals and book chapters. He has supervised 11 doctoral and more than 200 masters, both MTech and MSc uh, dissertations. He is associate editor, editorial board member, and reviewer of many national and international journals. He is an elected member of the International Statistical Institute, Netherlands. Uh, National Academy of Sciences India and has been an elected member of the Executive Committee of the Indian Society of Probability and Statistics. Uh, he is an elected General Council member of the Forum for Interdisciplinary Mathematics. He received the Platinum Jubilee Lecturer Award of the Indian Science Congress Association in 2016. He also received Professor K. S. Rao Best Researcher Award from Indian Society for Probability and Statistics in 2022. Uh, now, uh, I request Professor Somesh Kumar to deliver his lecture on uh, statistical interference for analyzing data from clinical trials. First of all, I thank the organizers of the conference uh, for inviting me to give a talk in this and share. Actually, I am a statistician. So, I mean, the conference is on Ayurveda. So, I mean, I, I am a methodological man. Like, I develop the methods of statistics, which can be used in any uh, branch of uh, science and technology. Uh, science, technology, social sciences. So, in, in fact, in particular, in any walk of life, as it, my slides will show. So when uh, <laughs> I was asked to give a talk, so I thought, okay, I will remodel it and uh, just say things that you can easily see that the statistical methods are 
equally applicable to uh, the development of Ayurvedic medicines, to Ayurvedic treatments, and for various other purposes. For example, Madam has just now told about medicinal plants to so to distinguish the properties uh, in what uh, category uh, of diseases those plants are useful. Uh, she has mentioned so we can do a more scientific and uh, a reason based study to popularize Ayurveda. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, start. So my topic is statistical inference for analyzing data from clinical trials. So I put a general title because uh, I think everybody is very well aware nowadays socially. So you see that as soon as any disease is discovered or those people who are working in uh, development of the medicines. What is the first thing that you notice is the development of the uh, uh, disease, uh, development of the treatment that how it is affecting people like whether if you give something then whether it is getting benefited or not. So how to measure that? For that we have the uh, clinical trials. So I, uh, in the process of new drug development clinical trials are performed on experimental objects which are like mice, guinea pigs, monkeys and finally humans. You have seen it on the COVID vaccine and then some medicines were there like remsedivir and some plasma therapy and so on. Uh, so in the initial phase the dosage of the drug to be administered to the patients it is determined and the process is called bioassays. So for example a drug dosage is increased in k steps until the optimal dose is reached and the rate of cure of patients at these k stages is denoted by, so I am just using some symbols here theta 1, theta 2, theta k, uh, like in generally in Ayurveda and all you do not look at the symbols, but it is okay, I am just mentioning. So then what we say, so it is something like mean cure rate or the mean survival etc. So we say that if the dosage is increased, then the cure rate increases. So theta 1 less than or equal to theta 2 less than or equal to theta k. So this is called bioassays or isotonic regression. So the problem of statistical inference of theta 1, theta 2, theta k under the order restrictions, it has been studied by many statisticians over the past 70 years and it has a uh, rich literature. So here we present some of the results. Uh, so actually I will talk historically also about the development of the statistical methods and at every stage starting from the 19th century onwards, actually the major applications have to be, have been in the biological sciences, in the genetic trials in many things including some infamous experiments also. Uh, we will mention about that also. So let me start with the uh, popular terminology data, probability, statistics and data science. So the term data is quite old. There are instructions for collecting data for agriculture, number of workers, crime, business, etc. So if you look at even uh, ancient texts like Kautilya's Arthashastra, you will find that thing and he has mentioned about that how to the data should be collected, how it should be stored and how it should be reported to the uh, king and so on. So there are references to the data collection by governments in uh, Gupta period, Chola period in South, Chalukya empires which were in the middle area of India, uh, ancient Rome, Greece and subsequently by many countries in the Europe. So it is very, very evident that in order to draw meaningful conclusions from any experiments in physical, chemical sciences, engineering, biosciences, clinical trials, medicine, psychology, genetics, agriculture, economics or social sciences, one needs to employ statistical tools. So initially the term statistics actually meant that the process of collecting the data and maybe just how, what is the data or collection of the data. However, now statistics actually means that planning and designing of the experiments, sampling and collection of the data, methods for modeling and analyzing data and finally drawing meaningful inferences from it to enable individuals, organizations and government to formulate policies. So the term statistics it has meant now development of the methods which use advanced computational techniques to analyze complex problems. And any person which is specialized in that, he is called data scientist. So data scientist is one of the very uh, in thing now, everybody talks about the data science. So the term probability that, so when you say have a patient and you say that he has got certain things, like he is reported with some uh, disease, okay. But if 
10 patients report whether all of them will have the same thing, same uh, properties. Suppose all of them come with the fever, but if you analyze them anatomically and physiologically, then there are various things that you will be observing and they will be different. This is called randomness or stochastic behavior. And therefore, the term probability comes into picture. So, let me mention about that thing. That is uncertainty in the physical phenomena. So, uncertainty like when you say coin tossing, dice throwing or gambling games and so on, that is known long back. So, you have references to it starting from Mahabharata and so on. But now, increasingly from 19th century onwards, it was observed that it is present in every walk of life. For example, you have what is the weather, uh, what is the height that a child will get finally who is born today, what is the total amount of food grains production, what is the age of a person. So, so there are so many people here, what would be the final age of a person? It is uh, stochastic in nature or random in nature. You cannot exactly predict anybody's age that he will be living exactly 80 years of age or 79 years, 6 months, 5 days and so on. It cannot be predicted. Uh, the height of a storm surge in a cyclone, the time to get cured after taking medicine for a certain disease. So, you take a certain formulation of a medicine and uh, then how much time it will take to get treated that is stochastic in nature. So, that has to be kept into account when we give the medicine to the patient, uh, the blood pressure levels and so on. So, if I am looking at the dosage, whether for every patient the same dose of the medicine is to be given, you have the same formulation, but a patient is of 20 years of age, another patient is of 50 years of age or there is a child say maybe of 3 years the dosage will be different also depending upon the CVRT of the disease. If the disease is mild, then you will give less dosage. If the disease is severe, then you have to give higher dosage with more frequency and so on. Okay. So, what I want to say, this is statistics is a general subject and it is applicable to all walks of life as I mentioned, but now you are all belonging to the Ayurveda. So, you have to see that how you can best optimize or use the tools of the uh, statistics. Okay. See, one major point which I have observed over the years that the major popularity of the western system of medicine or the allopathic medicine is that they have based it on the evidence thing. Whereas, in the Ayurveda, actually you have already all the formulations with you. So, that means yesterday it was mentioned. Uh, by uh, two or three of the speakers that probably those things were proved long back, maybe 2000 years back or something like that. So, that time were the people who developed and it was recorded in uh, Charak Sannita or Shushut Sainta, etc. Probably it is already proved and it was included there, but the record of that is not there. And when you are developing new medicines, because lot of new diseases uh, are seen like you had COVID and so on. Uh, <coughs> we keep on getting some new names, Ebola virus and all, all the time something new is coming up. So, when something new is coming up, of course, then you try to see whether it fits into one of the earlier formulations with the which are described in the Charak Sanita etc. But whether even to do that thing, you need some sort of statistical evidence actually and then only the Ayurveda thing will also be considered as established as this thing. I have seen there are research papers published in uh, uh, Lancet, etc., which are the major medicine journals, and they routinely condemn many things which are used in the Indian system, including, of course, homeopathy. Also, they they publish papers on that, and I have seen the incomplete statistical trials and unscientific trials are done, and they are just proving something. And why that? Because they are under pressure from the uh, allopathic medicine system because those drug companies are huge. They are multi billionaire companies, multinational companies and they somehow always they want to protect their kingdom. So, they do not allow others to grow up. I have gone to Germany etc. Actually, homeopathic for example, it has originated in Germany, but in Germany itself you will not find the uh, homeopathic shops or the doctors. So, you will find somewhere in the corner somewhere. Uh, 
some fellow will be sitting there. But generally, it is not because they have suppressed it. Okay, and similarly, Ayurveda system, of course, it is difficult to suppress because it is huge. But even then, the kind of popularity or the kind of uh, faith the public should have, it is not there. Except now in COVID period, somehow it turned out because the Western medicine, they were shocked. They did not have anything. And therefore, uh, the use of uh, different kind of kadhas and uh, then some vatis and other kind of thing, it is started and there was a huge sale. But was it not possible to develop in a scientific way? Of course, there were some claims that uh, it was done scientifically, but then you have to publish papers in the following the same standards that those big companies they follow because they sponsor the projects to the universities and to the research centers. They give the projects to the scientists and then they prove their thing. Okay, but why not do the same thing for our system also? I mean, we can say that our systems were proved, but everything is evolving. No, you have to keep on doing the things again and again to show the utility to the general population. I mean, you have to show that, yes, we have also done that. And I was very happy that uh, the other day, uh, I found large number of citations from at least one group, uh, this uh, Patanjali, because they have started a research institute also for medicinal things. And uh, they are doing the experiments and they are now publishing the papers. And uh, some of the papers have been published in the cited international journals, that means the reputed international journal. So that's a good thing, I mean, because then they are showing like I saw uh, somebody publishing the yo, uh, effect of this Brahmari and Udgit, etc. on the uh, blood pressure and so on. So there were many such studies and now they are publishing. But this is the need of the hour. I mean, we cannot say that since we are doing on the Indian system, so we will publish only in the Indian journals. No, you have to still publish in all the reputed journals. You publish in Indian journals, but you also publish in other journals. See, for example, uh, the physics people of India, they do not publish only in the Indian physics journal. They will publish everywhere. The people of mathematics or the people of chemical engineering, they will publish everywhere. So that is the thing required for the Ayurveda also. So as a researcher, because I am to myself do the research, this is the need of the hour. I will mention now a uh, few things here. <coughs> about the methods here. Uh, so let me just say about this thing. So the I mentioned about the probability. Uh, so the probability started in the 16th century and later on the formal thing which we actually teach in the classroom that is developed in the 20th century. And uh, these are some of the people who actually developed the modern theory of probability. So I'm just mentioning some example here. So consider a new blood test for a disease. The measurements are based on presence of molecules in the cells where the readings are few thousands or lakhs per ml, etc. That is the way you read, no? Like it will be written uh, 100 per ml and that kind of readings are come when you get the test report, isn't it? So basically what is happening, the result, the final result which will be shown there, it is based on the total sum of the readings. Isn't it? They finally, at the end of the thing, it is written whether it is significant or not significant because some range is written and whether it is outside the range. That means the result which is mentioned there, that is the total measurement. So that means the distribution of the sum of the deceased cells which is present in the sample, that is the required. So here now I come to the theory part that uh, many statisticians, they have developed the uh, results for the asymptotic behavior of the di distribution of the sums of the independent random variables. So I am just putting some names which may not be of very much interest to the people here. That is weak law and strong law of large numbers, central limit theorems and so on. And uh, so we also have independent as well as dependent trials. So, so because many times the affected cells will, they will affect the neighboring cells also, isn't it? So there will be dependencies. If there is dependency, then it becomes dependent process. So the results for the limit theorems for the sums of dependent variables are also being studied. It's an active area of research. So just I will mention, I have written some research paper at the bottom. So this is my research scholar. We have published some papers on this. Limit theorems for the sums of uh, independent and non-identically Bernoulli random variables. So what do you mean by Bernoulli? That means a cell is deceased or not deceased. 
That means it can be deceased or not deceased. So you will be counting the total number. How many cells are deceased? For example, when you do the, uh, I mean, study any kind of disease, so then you look at, for example, your fine biopsy and that kind of thing also the same kind of thing happens. So this is one active area of research and we have some contribution there. I just listed some of the research papers here with my student that we have published here. Uh, <coughs> let me go to another topic where we have worked. Then the second thing is actual modeling of the real distribution. Now many times what happens that, uh, for example, when a patient goes, you check his pulse, for example, Nadi Chikitsa like in Ayurveda, but in the general like in allopathic also you check uh, blood pressure, you check the fever and so on. Many things are checked and based on that certain diagnosis is made, isn't it? Now for the same person when the height, weight, uh, pulse rate, uh, breathing and so on, everything is checked. These are all considered correlated because for different person it will be something different. For one person it will be correlated because for one person what is his body weight, what is his height and so on they will be related, isn't it? So the study of finding out the distributions of this that is another important aspect of the uh, statistical study and again I mean we have one contribution I have just mentioned here, one paper we have published in 2020 that is the bivariate mixture of negative binomial distribution and its applications. Two minutes, okay. Yeah. I'll just try to finish here. I just uh, wanted to give a very quick glimpse of uh, how much statistics is useful in all the walks of. This is another problem I will mention. Uh, this is called uh, common mean problem. So you are getting data from various sources. For example, this COVID data. So during COVID, Thing what happened that, for example, in the Indian conditions, uh, you give, say, COVID vaccine, for example, and COVID vaccine is given to people of, say, Maharashtra, COVID vaccine is given to the people of Kerala, COVID vaccine is given to. What is the level of antibodies developed? Isn't it? So you try to look at whether there are differences or whether they are same. Isn't it? So there is a problem of classification. For example, ethnic groups they are same or different, isn't it? So that means their uh, genetic properties or their uh, biological properties or their anatomical properties they are different or not, isn't it? This is called problem of discrimination and classification. Although the initial genesis of this thing was uh, slightly mired in the controversies, but uh, now it is okay, it has found the very useful things in the uh, medical areas. So I am mentioning one thing about the common mean problem and I found uh, this is one research paper, uh, few research papers actually we have published and uh, recently I have found one reference in uh, a paper which is written on diagnosis of the brain tumor. It is published in the Journal of Bioinformatics by some group in uh, United Kingdom and they have cited our work. So I just wanted to mention that thing here. Uh, so <laughs> I think it is very quick and yeah, I mean a lot of things are there, but I think I may not be able to tell everything. Uh, so just I want to show this uh, photograph here. He is PC Malanobis and he happens to be my, uh, you can say academic ancestor of sixth generation. So gu guide of my guide and he is the founder of the Indian Statistical Institute and founder of the statistical movement in India. And the reason that in India, India is considered as pioneer in the statistics area is because of him actually. So I, and one of his measures, I just mentioned it here, it is called Mahalanobis distance. And uh, this Mahalanobis distance uh, he gave, it is called Mahalanobis D square. And uh, so it is used for the problem of finding out the di distance between two ethnic groups. So like I want to classify whether the people of uh, India are quite different from the people of say, uh, Europe and so on. So we consider the characteristics, the facial characteristics, the uh, bodily characteristics and so on. Uh, I think uh, I'll just end my talk here. Thank you very much. But there is a lot of scope of using statistics in Ayurveda. Already all the uh, allopathic medicine studies, uh, development of new drugs, cures, uh, the comparison between the things, everything is done by statistics. In fact, 
they cannot publish papers without using statistics. Professor Das is here, they can tell that thing. Uh, so the need of the hour is that Ayurveda people also should use the statistical techniques and verify their results and then publish in the well-cited, well-reputed international journals. That is the need of the hour to bring it to the world level actually. I mean like you have this thing but it is not enough just to say that okay we are very good. We others also should say and for example whenever any new disease comes or anything then this, this can be the first choice. Yesterday I was talking with uh, Dr. Samantha, he was telling that in Ayurveda also we have the quick solutions. It's not that in acute diseases, it's not that only for chronic diseases you should use Ayurveda. He said uh, he has treated patients for uh, kidney diseases, that means somebody who is on dialysis he was treated and so on. So we have to popularize that and for that you need the scientific basis and statistics is needed there. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, presenting the importance of statistical trials in um, the field of medicine. Uh, sir, please. Uh, I request Professor Shri Kumarji to felicitate Professor Somesh Kumarji. A ninth century mathematician, uh, Mahavira, the great mathematician, says, Sope tatha vaidye vaidya shastre vastu vidyati vastushu sarvatra ganitam param. So mathematics is everywhere. He enlists all the uh, subjects where mathematics is used. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we move on to the next speaker. Uh, I invite Dr. Swarnin Dubhag. Uh, he is an assistant professor at CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Bhag received his PhD from IIT Kharagpur. Presently, he is working as an assistant professor at CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology and Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, Government of India, New Delhi. He, have, he has diverse experiences in academic and research domain as faculty, scientist, uh, in rep, uh, different reputed institutions like National Institute of Technology, Sikkim, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata, Ames, New Delhi, Etc. His research focuses his research focuses on the study of multimodal spectroscopy and analysis of for the detection uh, and qu quantification of biomolecules for early diagnosis, prognosis, and predictive marker discovery of different types of cancer and metabolic disorders, as well as the characterization of therapeutic molecules from natural products. Uh, over to you, sir. So, a uh, very good morning to all of you. So, till now we have enjoyed very nice and informative talk from different Ayurvedic expert. So, I will not reiterate the same things. Uh, <clears throat> I just would like to mention one thing that now the modern allopathic medicine think about the personalizations, personalized medicine or personalized therapy. But this new concept is already exist, already had in our ancient age old Ayurvedic system, Ayurvedic health system. So now it reveals that our Ayurvedic knowledge is how reached. So, <coughs> Like in Ayurveda, I am not the Ayurveda biologist, but as far as I know from you, in Ayurveda, the, the main concept is three dosa and three guna, the bath, pitta and kapha, and three guna, raja, tama, and raja, tama, 
and Satya Guna. So these are nothing but the personalized attributes. So today I will disc but uh, we, the scientists, the faculty, the clinicians, the, re the researchers from Ayurveda biology generally faced a common question from the modern allopathic medicine scientific community regarding the standardization, whether your product is standardized, whether it is validated, or which is the specific molecular signature amongst the Ayurvedic composition have the specific uh, responsible for the specific therapeutic effect and what is the dosage regimen. Although there are a lot of compendia, Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia and li literature uh, reveals the standardization, but to address this question, now this is the high time to couple this Ayurved biology or Ayurvedic health system to the advanced analytical tool. So today I will uh, I will discuss about the spectros how spectroscopic different spectroscopic technique is helpful to analyze, standardize, and validate the Ayurvedic compositions. Now, so as for the uh, National Institute of Health, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. The Ayurved treatment combines the uh, de derived from plants, but may also include animal, metal, mineral, diet, exercise, and lifestyle. So the ancient Indian medical system, also known as Ayurveda, is based on the ancient writings. They rely on the natural and holistic approach to p uh, physical and mental health. So before going to the advanced technique to analyze the Ayurvedic product, so what are the so what are the ancient protocol for standardization the drug? See, they standardize the drug based on some basic properties like nature of the drug, idha meva prakritam, the specific property evam gunam, the specific effect of the drug. Evam Prabhavam. So uh, the found or cultivated in the particular place, which is Asmin, they say Jatam. The <coughs> stored under certain conditions, Evam Nihitam. And processed of prepared in a particular manner is Evam up Upaskritam. So these are the basic property by which in ancient time the drug was standardized. Now, uh, before going to the analysis or standardizations, we have to know how we pharmacologically classified, chemically classified the Ayurvedic product. So mainly the Ayurvedic pro product, which comes from the plant origins, they contain the alkaloid, glycoside, carbohydrate, volatile oil, resin, tannins, enzymes, and lipids. Like here, <coughs> the vinca, uh, which contain the vincristine and vinblastin alkaloid, which have tremendous effect on anti-cancer. Like Nax Bhumika, which contains the brucin, and we all know the alloy, a, it contains the alloy imodin, the tea, it contains the theophylline uh, alkaloids, and clove, it contains the vo volatile oil eugenol, and <coughs> then lots of things, ginseng, benzoin, catechu, etc. Now, what are the chemical structures of this uh, compound? So now, if we see, so if we want to characterize this chemical compound, so what would be our first goal? So to uh, know an unknown compound, first we have to know its molecular weight. After that, we have to know its molecular formula, what are the functional group pre present, and what are the atomic environment of this uh, molecule. So here you see some example, this is called the uh, epinephrine or epidrine, used as a psychotic drug or uh, neuronal drug. Then oliendrine, this is a potent toxic cardiac glycoside used in heart disease. Carbohydrate, eugenol, resin like benzoin, 
tannin, lanolin, and flavonoids. <coughs> so, what are the spectroscopy are generally used to elucidate the chemical formula, structures, and properties of this molecule? First, we know the UV visible spectroscopy, then the LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spectra, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, FTIR, Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, and Raman spectroscopy, then latest is quantum spectroscopy. So means spectroscopy can be used to extract the information from every atomic, molecular, and subatomic structures. So I'll explain a little bit because due to time constraint, I just explain the how you can interpret the graph and the basic principles of this spectroscopy. Like LCM SMS, you can identify the mass of the molecule. NMR, you can identify the atomic environment in a molecule. I'll explain later what is atomic environment. FTIR and Raman spectroscopic, uh, you can identify what are the functional group present in that molecule. And quantum spectroscopy latest, it is uh, developed, it is in research phase in Michigan University. They are developing such spectroscopy which can el elucidate the quantum phenomena also. So from molecular level to atomic level to proton, neutron, quartz, and then quantum. So spectroscopy has a huge role to characterize the matter. Now before going to the spectroscopy, what is the general rule? The spectroscopy is nothing but the interaction of electromagnetic wave with the different energy level of molecular, atomic, subatomic, and quantum level structure of the matter. So generally, the spectroscopy or wavelength used to characterize the molecules are radio wave, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. So we'll discuss about here the NMR, uh, which works in the radio wavelength region, the infrared FTIR, wh which works in the uh, infrared or IR region, the visible and ultraviolet spectroscopy to characterize the molecule. So if uh, the wavelength, in th there is a uh, wavelength is inversely proportional to the energy. So if wavelength increases, the energy of the electromagnetic wave decreases. So here, the interactions of electromagnetic energy with the energy level of different atomic, subatomic molecular structures. So now, first is mass spectroscopy. So to characterize unknown chemical structures, we first need to know the masses of the molecules. So by mass spectrometry, we can identify and know the masses of the molecule. Like here I am giving an example of eugenol. So eugenol is a uh, volatile oil. We, we get it from the cloak. It has a, a analgesic, antibacterial, and antibiotic effect. So now we see the molecular weight of eugenol is 164. So in mass spectrometry, we, we can uh, get a peak M by Z, M here mass and Z means charge. So from mass spectrometry, we'll get a M by Z of that eugenol. So what is the basic principle of mass spectrometry? I just will say, the first, the molecule to be analyzed is mass spectrometry. It is first ionized. So after ionization, this ion will be detected by the de detector in vacuum concentration. And this detector from digital to analog conversation, it, uh, it will gi uh, give the peak. So now, after knowing the mass, we have to know the chemical formula or chemical structure of the, no, so after uh, two things we have to know after knowing the mass. One is the what functional group present in that molecule and what is the chemical structure. So to know the functional group, we will do the FTR spectroscopy. So FTR spectroscopy, this IR spectroscopy, this electromagnetic wave interacts with the bond, chemical bond of the present in the functional group. If it is OH, 
alcohol, it is a ketone CO, and it is COH or aldehyde CHO. So each and every functional group give a specific wavelength. This is called wave number. Like your, if the uh, functional group is keto CO, so the, it shows the wave number in FTR spectroscopy is 1680 to 1750. If the functional group is alcohol, it gives 3230 to 3550. If it is CH, it will give the 2850 to 3300 wave number. And if OH in, in carboxylic acid, it will give 2500 to 3300. So here you see, I will uh, iterate the same example eugenol. So it, uh, it contains the main functional group OH, eugenol, it's the alcohol group. So it will give a wave number signature peak in 3510 region. So now, here is a, 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 a twist is that in FTR spectroscopy, we can detect only the bond which formed by the heteronuclei. Means if it is OH, we can detect. If it is CO, we can detect. But if the group is OO, NN, then if the bond is formed by the homo nucleus, means O and O, N and N, then this type of functional group cannot be detected through FTR spectroscopy. Then we have to go for the Raman spectroscopy, which is also a, a spectroscopy to detect the functional group present in the molecule. So now we go to the NMR spectroscopy. So I told you that the atomic environment. So here you see from the mass spectrometry and FTR spectroscopy, we identify that yes, the molecular weight is this, the functional group is OH, and the molecule contains the main element atom OH, carbon, and hydrogen. But these two spectroscopy cannot tell whether this H is attached, how many protons or hydrogen is attached to the carbon, how many carbon is uh, have a CC bond or CO bond. So this atomic environment we cannot get from the previous spectroscopy I discussed. Now to elucidate the actual chemical structures and to the atomic environment of the each atom will do the NMR spectroscopy. Now, the NMR spectroscopy range is radio wave. So that electromagnetic wave interacts with the electron spinning, right? So from the electron spinning or ele uh, electron spinning changes, we can identify how many types of carbon, how many types of proton are present in that molecule. So here you see that this is a carbon NMR. There's a lot of, there is carbon NMR, proton NMR, phosphorus NMR, this is the carbon NMR. So from this carbon N NMR, we can know, we, we can identify how many types of carbon present in that molecule. So here you see that there are nine types of carbon present in eugenol. You see uh, this carbon, is differ, this, the electronic environment of this carbon is different to this carbon, is different to this carbon. So there are nine types of carbon are pre present in these structures, right? So as per this, we will get the nine peak having nine different PPM value and ha ha having nine different intensity from this NMR peak. So this is the general spectroscopic method we used to characterize the molecules of in present in Ayurvedic composition. And thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bach. Uh, I, I request uh, Professor Debashish Bakshi to uh, come on the dais and felicitate the speaker.
Boa noite. Thank you, Dr. Bhag, and thank you, Professor Bakshi. Uh, now uh, we are going to enjoy the herbal tea. So, the, so thereafter we have sessions on yeah uh, we have 10 minutes break now पतंजलि से जो जुड़े हैं मनीष जी उनसे निवेदन है कि वो अपना वीडियो ऑन करें हम आपको देख या सुन नहीं पा रहे हैं इस समय में and now we are having a special address by a very famous personality in the field of ayurveda swami ramdev ji swami ramdev ji needs no introduction as such his work in ayurveda is ayurveda and yoga is quite well known to everybody of every one of us and he is preliminary pre preliminary known for being a proponent of yoga ayurveda in india पतंजलि से जो है कम से प्लीज अपना वीडियो ऑन करिएगा नहीं सर आपको मेरी आवाज आ रही है हाँ आवाज आ रही है आपकी आवाज आ रही है लेकिन आप दिख नहीं आप दिख नहीं रहे लेकिन सर मैं ये कह रहा हूँ जो दूसरे आप जुड़े हुए थे उनको आपने एक चीज कर दिया है मीटिंग से तो वो दोबारा ज्वाइन नहीं कर पा रहे हैं मीटिंग को वो ये है स्वामी जी के साथ आप समझिए मैं क्या कह रहा हूँ आपको जो आपके साथ पहले जुड़े हुए थे उन्होंने उनको आपने एक कर दिया है हम, हमने एग्जिट नहीं किया सर वो एग्जिट हो गए थे बट सेम लिंक पे सर आप उनको बोलिए ज्वाइन करने के लिए सर मैंने उनको बार बार दिखा रहा है की यू आर you are active by the week status so you cannot rejoin back hello dekh rahe we are checking hello? we are checking yes ha ah, yeah please check it because this person is trying and he is not able to join so i am joining i am joining from phone so i can join but this person is not able to join hmm. dipesh दीपेश सर दीपेश सर दीपेश सर अजय मुझे की ईमेल आईडी यू वांट हिज ईमेल आईडी मनीष जी वो जो जो ज्वाइन होने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं उनका ईमेल आईडी मिल सकता है हमें यहां चैट में आप चैट में लिख के चैट में लिख के भेज दीजिए जस्ट
सम मोर डिटेल्ड इंफॉर्मेशन अबाउट स्वामी रामदेव जी दो इज वेरी वेल नोन so he has uh, conducted uh, many large size camps uh, on yoga since he has been doing that since 2002 and uh, he has been his camps have been uh, broadcasted on tv channels and as we all of all of us know he is a co is he co-founded patanjali ayurved and patanjali yoga peet with his colleague balakrishna in 2006 indian express has ranked Baba Ramdev ji as the 78th in the list of 100 most powerful Indians in 2002 American business magazine Fast Company ranked uh, Swami Ramdev ji 27th in the most creative business people in 2016 list Yogarshi Swami Ramdev ji was born to Shrimati Gulab Devi and Shri Ram Nivas in village of Haryana he had his early education in the village school, in that village school at the age of 14 he was admitted to the gurukul at kalwa near jind haryana where under the blessing uh, blessed tutelage of acharya shri baldev ji he studied sanskrit and yoga he earned a post graduate degree with, that is acharya with specialization in sanskrit vyakarana yoga darshana yoga darshana vedas upanishads later he was very much inspired by the life and writings of maharshi dayanand and he thoroughly studied satyartha prakash rigveda bhashya bhumi rigveda adi bhashya bhumi ka etc alongside the magnetism of maharshi patanjali as an exponent of yoga sanskrit grammar and ayurveda continued to exert its influence on him quite early in life he had his goals cut out for him so he chose the path of celibacy and ascetism after do, doing a saint of uh, uh, after doing a stint of teaching yoga panini ashtadhyayi and patanjali's mahabhashya at gurukuls he set out on a journey to the gangotri caves of lofty himalayas away from the distraction of mundane activities through deep meditation and ascetic dip- discipline and penance he was able to develop a clear vision of work to be done by him propagation of yoga and ayurveda and uh, reforming the social political economic system of india and then luckily he met with acharya bal krishna and uh, that a kindled soul and a schoolmate who was out there on similar quests they came together to launch upon his stupendous task for uh, from scratch Swami ji took upon himself the responsibility of demystifying and popularizing Patanjali yoga while Acharya ji devoted himself to the task of restoring people's faith in the efficacy of ayurvedic system of medicine Swami ji's main focus is on making people of India as well as of the whole world adopt yoga and ayurveda as their lifestyle his approach to treating ailments and disorders is pragmatic undogmatic and non uh, uh non sectarian all persons whether hindu or muslims or sikh or christian have the same anatomy and physiology therefore they can all benefit from yoga and ayurveda therapy he has explained in detail the benefits accruing from yoga in his two popular hindi books on this subject yoga sadhana evam yoga chikitsa rahasya and the second one is pranayam rahasya his yoga camps are very popular and have been attended by thousands of participants all over the country he emphasizes on doing eight pranayamas bastrika kapalabhati bahya agnisar ujjayi anulom vilom brahmari and udgitha and pranava some sukshma vyayamas and some specific asanas he has been advising for curing various ailments since a very long time so today baba ramdev ji uh, will be addressing us live from 
um, uh, through through video conferencing. So very shortly we are going to have Baba Ramdev Ji online addressing this very special occasion of Ayurdhara. There are some technical settings going on. So very shortly, we will have the blessings of Baba Ramdev on this very special occasion, on this Ayurdhara Symposium. Our technical team is trying to connect with Baba Ramdev Ji's team and very shortly we'll be having him online. हाँ आप लोग जुड़ चुके हैं पतंजलि से हम आपको देख पा रहे हैं आपसे निवेदन है कि अपना वीडियो और ऑडियो कृपया ऑन कर दीजिए हाँ हम आपको देख पा रहे हैं अभी मेरी आवाज आ रही है सर आपको जी जी बिल्कुल बढ़िया से जा रही है बिल्कुल बढ़िया से जा रही है हाँ सर हो गया हाँ जी हाँ जी हाँ जी अभी वो सब बैठे हैं किसी के पास आने वाले हैं वो नहीं 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 सर अंदर है वो भी बाहर नहीं है ठीक है ओम ओम जी हम आपको सुन पा रहे हैं हम आपको सुन पा रहे हैं आवाज एकदम क्लियर है वीडियो भी क्लियर है और हम सभी यहाँ उनका उनके आशीर्वाद पाने के लिए सभी हम सभी एकत्रित हो गए हैं ओम नमस्कार हाँ हाँ जी सर मैं आचार्य रजनीश बात कर रहा हूँ अच्छा 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 नमस्ते बोलिए हाँ तो अभी ठीक है हम थोड़ा तब तक कुछ बातें कर लेते हैं लेकिन ये इसको हम डिस्टर्ब नहीं करेंगे अभी ऐसे ही रहेगा आप अभी अभी स्क्रीन पे ही रहेंगे हाँ 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 But then, ah, I am saying that.
Let them put it here. Uh, kindly bear with us uh, because this is a remote link and uh, we are actually engaging a very uh, important personality in our country. Uh, we are not directly associated his, with his activities, but the little thing that we know, I know is that one of the earliest traditions of Ayurveda goes back to the works of a very ancient personality who probably uh, stands between uh, in time between a very ancient age about which we have no idea which is the Vedic and the Upanishadic age and everything is which is after him from the times of Buddha to the modern age. He is uh, Maharshi Patanjali, Maharshi Patanjali and we have about hundreds of proof and proofs and evidence in our historical continuum that Maharshi Patanjali definitely existed and he had written one of the most powerful treaties on yoga, which is called the Yoga Sutras. Uh, why it's important? Because it has inspired a very rational thinking of the system of yoga, of which Ayurveda, the pranayama, the breathing cycles, uh, which are coordinated by a yogi in a very much perfected form as compared to an ordinary human being, uh, which I shared with you yesterday, is very recently uh, recognized in modern science by the 2017 Nobel Prize on what is known as the equivalent term, the circadian rhythm in the West. So Maharshi Patanjali is one of the most authentic treaties on, on uh, yoga. The, his yoga sutras were used by Swami Vivekananda in a seminal book called Raj Yoga, which was published from France in 1896. It is one of the first authentic book on yoga ever published by an Indian yogi in the West. Uh, this book became very famous and uh, it was not published in India first. It was initially in French language followed by English and finally in the Americas it became a very important book. It had a lot of Im impact on the next generation of yoga and the pursuits of yoga and with a distant and also a very close connection with Ayurveda. And finally, reading this book, many personalities were attracted uh, to come to India. So one of them was American explorist, humorist, Mark Twain. So he came to India uh, almost around the same time, within an year, to explore uh, Varanasi, the seat of yoga, and other cities of India. And the other thing is, it also attracted a very important personality from France. Her name was Mira Alfaza. Uh, so when she read the book of Swami Vivekananda and the, and the treatise of Yoga Sutra written by Maharshi Patanjali, she was attracted to India. She came via Egypt and finally she met one of the great yogis of modern India, that's Maharshi Aurobindo. And uh, eventually, after 25 years of intense sadhana, which is yoga, she was recognized as the mother of Pondicherry. Uh, and then within... Uh, uh, a few years when Swami Vivekananda left the United States, he was repla replaced by another yogi, uh, which is Swami Avedananda. And Avedananda ji continued the mission of yoga in the West. And uh, very interestingly, he was supported by the House of Tagore. So great personalities like uh, Shushoma Devi and others in the US, they were all in the Americas at that time, supported Swami Avedananda to spread further uh, the message of yoga. And then a very interesting thing happened. The day Swami Avidananda left the West as a representative of Indian systems of yoga in the United States of America, on that same day, or perhaps the next day, another great yogi landed in the United States, that is Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, the author of the autobiography of a yogi, and he landed in the United States, and through him, uh, the traditions of yoga and Ayurveda to a certain extent continued in the West. And then uh, Paramahansa Yogananda-ji was also accompanied by other systems of yoga which were, which were, uh, which were uh, followed uh, by other people in India uh, like uh, the gharanas of Kashmiri uh, Shaivism and others. So some of them uh, probably you know, probably you don't know was the whole uh, lineage of Swami Nityananda from Pune uh, and also from Ganeshpuri in Maharashtra. 
and his disciple was Swami Muktananda. And Swami Muktananda's disciple were some of the greatest physicists and psychologists of the West, like Dr. Fritztop Kapra of the University of Berkeley in physics, who wrote in 1984 one of the uh, first book on physics being compared to Indian spirituality. It's very famous, probably some of you know about this book. It has been sold about 9 million copies till date. It's known as the Tao of Physics, the Tao of Physics. And within a few years, he wrote books like The Uncommon Wisdom. And then he was joined by other great transpersonal psychologists and behavioral uh, phenomenal psychologists like Andrew Cohen and Ken Wilbur. And together, they founded the Californian Institute of Integral Studies uh, in the West. And uh, there was one great Russian or Serbian scientist he was essentially a microbiologist. His name was Professor Stanley Slav Grof. Stanley Slav Grof. So Grof actually uh, forwarded Patanjali's Yoga Sutra to the domains of modern science and physiology. And that started attracting a whole new generation of microbiologists and physiologists in the United States of America, mostly, and also in other countries. And then another movement of Indian spirituality in the West took up this responsibility. It was the International uh, Consciousness Society of Krishna Consciousness, what do you call ISKCON. So from about uh, 1960s to the 70s and the 80s, ISKCON organized some of the earliest uh, religion and science seminars, both in the US and uh, and also in India and other countries like Russia and Germany. And they invited great Nobel laureates like Karl Pibram, Charles Town, and uh, uh, many of the other scientists who have worked on the neuroplasticity of the brain, you know, the combination of the left side thinking which goes towards analytics and mathematics, and the right side thinking which goes towards deep thinking, intuition, and meditation. And then the balance of the two which creates the central vertebra, which is the whole shushumna, which is yoga itself. So this is a very interesting thing, and I think uh, we need to keep a track whether we are with him or not, because uh, uh, the person probably who are whom you are going to hear within a few moments belongs to that gharana of Patanjali Yoga Sutra. So it's it's nothing new. It has been there in India for thousands of years, and. Uh, Baba Ramdev's gharana, his whole treatise uh, on Ayurveda and his creations have many questions and answers, many issues and strengths, but that's not the point. The essential point is that he's one of the first brave persons who went out to create an establishment and compete with Western biofarm mega giants and multinational corporations. So in that sense, he is probably the first man, the first person who could compete with Western competitive multinational allopathic drugs driven uh, approach to medication. So one of his medicine, which is coronil, I'm becoming a little blatant here, became very powerful. And uh, it, it included one very important element, which was discovered in the course of iterative uh, medical practices. One of my brother, he's a homeopathic doctor, and he tried that medicine on the corona patients during the second wave. And he was yesterday here, Dr. Boidunath Mondol, and he tried that medicine on about 1,000 patients during the second wave of COVID in the regions called Tarokeshwar. And the name of that medicine is Kalomeg, Kalmeg. And all the 1,000 plus patients with whom he treated with Kalomeg, not a single person died. None of them were hospitalized. So if you, yeah, none of them was hospitalized. Now the beauty is that, I'm talking at a very superficial level because I'm not an expert. The beauty is that if you go to the medical taxonomy of coronil, if you go to the medical taxonomy of coronil, inside you'll see that of the seven ingredients which make up coronil, one is Kalmeg. One is Kalmeg. And if you go, yes, one is Kalmeg. And it has been recognized by the Charaka, particularly the Charaka Susruta, and to an extent by the Susruta 
Sanghita long, long back. Of course, there's no mention of COVID, but it talks about pulmon pulmonary or respiratory diseases in large. So which means right from the ancient days to the modern days, Indian physicians at some level had a very deep understanding of different levels of diseases at the, at the levels of the pineal gland of the thalamus, which is uh, kapha, and then the, the, at the level of the heart zone uh, 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 and, and the solar plexus, which is the navel center, which is pitta, and then at the level of the, the lower abdomen, uh, which is the lower, you know, the, the basal uh, or the sacral and the cochegeal points of the human vertebra, which is actually the bata. So essentially when you're talking about, essentially when you're talking about bata, pitta, kapha, you're actually talking about the three uh, neural ganglic centers of the human body. Uh, how the sympathetic nervous system is distributed as ganglias in the lower half, then its concentration in the solar plexus, which is nabhi, and finally at the agya chakra or the bhrumadhyaya, the command zone, which is actually the, the zone of uh, kapha. So it is actually a deep science and it, it needs to be understood holistically. And these are the things, as Professor Kumar, Professor Shomesh Kumar had rightly said, needs to come out as research papers in the top journals of the world. So what we are trying to do uh, with the kind cooperation of our dean and present head of the School of Medical Science and Technology, Professor Shoman Das, and the former head and also the advisor, uh, Professor Jyotir Moya Chatterjee. We are trying to explore the possibility of introducing an Ayush cell at IIT Kharagpur. Yeah, so this is, this is not a tall promise. This is not a tall promise because it involves rigor it involves dedication. So A for Ayurveda, Y for yoga, U for the extension of yoga and Ayurveda in the West, Arab, Iran, Persia, and Greece. The word Unani comes from the ancient word Ionani, which is the sacred Milesian seat of philosophy in Turkey, Anatolia. So it is from the word Ionian, which is Ionic philosophy, the word Unani actually originated. So that's U. And then finally you come to S, which is Siddh, which is the foundation of Indian spirituality. And finally, an extension of Ayurveda, one of the branches of Ayurveda, which is Agada Tantra. We are just discussing uh, with Professor Dhara and Professor Mukherjee, who has just arrived today from SNST IIT Kharagpur, which is toxicology, which in the 17th century was actually uh, felt by a yogi-like physician, his name was Professor Samuel Hahnemann. So Samuel Hahnemann internally practiced a life of a yoga, if you have gone through his life, and externally he was a, med he was a, a medical practitioner. So he went back to the original Celtic, Caledonian, Gaulish repository of oriental medicine that was available in the 16th century literature with Nasrid, Sultanates, the Emirate of Cordova, because the Arabic in civilization was there in Western Europe till about 13th, 14th century. And after the fall of Granada, it went to the hand of the Christians. So he discovered all these texts, developed his own rudimentary lab, and he worked on the, the countering of the two toxics. So when you have a toxic directly, you die. But when you find out the toxic, which is already there inside your body, which can be countered with another toxic, then the first toxic becomes an ambrosia, amrita. So that is the foundation of homeopathy. That is the foundation of homeopathy. So that is a straightforward extension of one of the branches of Ayurveda, which is agad tanta. Gad means toxic. Agad means you're converting the toxic into amrita. So that is the whole parable or the mystical imagery of the Samudra Manthana, where first, the vish, the vicious things. See, the words are also the same, vish and vicious things come up. And then amrita or ambrosia, because these are all ancient Sanskrit Greek words. And they were, these words were formed about 3,000, 4,000 years back in the ways of history. So there are a lot of proofs, there are a lot of evidence to establish how India had civilized the whole world 
through many domains, mathematics being one of the largest, and probably the second one is Ayurveda. So in that sense, through the pursuit of Ayurveda, we also get the strength of recovering India's contribution to the whole world. And there's actually a book written by a great uh, Australian Sanskrit professor, uh, and also professor of philosophy. Perhaps many of you have read his book. His book really changed the course of Indian thinking by Westerners. His, his name is Professor Ail Basham, and the name of the book is The Wonder That Was India. So if you have not read that book, The Wonder That Was India, so if you have not read that book, I'll request especially the youngsters who are present today, please have a look at the book. There's a small portion in that book which is dedicated to medicines and the origins of Indian herbal drugs and medications from the ancient Vedic times. So Professor Basham uh, had spent his lifetime and uh, uh, to the recovery of various uh, Indian knowledge systems. So that time we have nothing called the Indian knowledge system, but uh, he dedicated his life. So are we, are we with them? Are they visible? Okay, so I have two more minutes to continue my very you know, low level you know, uh, uh, whatever deliberation with you. It gives me an opportunity. It gives me an opportunity and uh, Dr. Mahesh has given me that golden opportunity. Yeah. So what happens today is that, uh, what happens today, a time has now come uh, to actually uh, come out of the reductionist model only, which just looks at a one solution to a one problem. The problem with the Newtonian Cartesian reductionist model is that it has on the one hand contributed to a huge domain of science, which I was trying to share with you yesterday. But at the same time, it has narrowed the scientific mind to a one track, one objective process oriented solution of looking at things. So when you do that, in the name of science, you start disrespecting the second path or the third path and the fourth path because you are reduced to a a single path. It, it goes even to an extent when a mechanical engineer starts disrespecting the electrical engineer or even the architect starts disrespecting the geographer or the historian starts avoiding the musician. Yeah, because it makes you reduced to a single path. So such a movement in India was actually revived by Asia's first Nobel laureate, that's Gurudev Ravindranath Thakur. And I think you know in Shantiniketan, in Shantiniketan, Rabindranath Thakur himself created the various schools of Indian knowledge systems. And one of them was herbal medicine and Ayurveda. And various people actually came and joined that movement. And uh, one of the person who was closest to that movement, Professor Kumar is an authority uh, uh, to that, that was Professor Ronald Fisher. Through the friendship which, which, he, which he was actually trying to tell you and he didn't have the time, <laughs> he was not given the time uh, and with the aid of pro another professor of statistics, of one of the fathers of cryptology if I'm right, that's Professor Prashant Mahalnabish. So Prashant Mahalnabish took Ronald Fisher to Shantiniketan and Tagore and he, they were very impressed by Tagore's universal interest in universal wisdom and finally uh, he, he was guided by another great person, one of the fathers of modern Indian science, that, that is Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose. So Bose, Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose, Prashantan Mahalnabish, and another lady from the Ramakrishna movement, Sister Nivedita, actually founded a very young man. He, is, he was a modern graduate in medicine and botany, that is Dr. Boshishar Sen. And then Boshishar Sen was actually funded by the Tagore, uh, it was not called a foundation, and also supported by J.C. Bose and, uh, and Prashant Mahalnabish to reach the Himalayas and open up the first herbal biotechnological institute at Almora. At Almora. So as students of Ayurveda, uh, if you're interested, it's a must visit. It's like the Tirtha. It's like the first temple of Ayurveda in the Himalayas. And you believe it or not, the Western companies like Himalayan drugs had actually created a research wing to probe into this. In India, we have not done that. In India, we don't have time for such things. So they had actually created and probed into the, the origins of herbal aspects on which 
Dr. Madhu Gupta beautifully spoke in the morning, the first talk today's morning. So about, about I don't know, I, I don't want to make this quantitative statement, about 40% of Ayurveda is all from nature, is all from nature. And, uh, and the other thing comes from more organized nature, which is metal, metal sciences and metallurgical sciences. By nature, I mean is uh, herbs and plant. And I think if I have just 30 more seconds, I'll just mention something which is very interesting to the young generation. So very recently there, there, there was a movie which was made by a great film director. His name is James Cameroon. And he made a movie which made him world famous. That's the Titanic. That's a Titanic. And his second movie is called Avatar. And if you have seen that movie, how many of you have seen that movie in this auditorium? Good. So in, if, you, if you see that movie two times, you know, if, you, if you have to understand the movie, you should at least watch a movie two times. Because the first time you see the movie, and the second time you actually see the movie. You know, and you start uh, getting into the message of uh, Avatar. So what is actually portrayed in the Avatar? James Cameron has showed that the reductionist, materialistic, consumeristic science and technology of the world is so arrogant that they fail to understand a more advanced biotechnological and neuroalgorithmic system that exists in a planet uh, far, far away in the galaxy. And just because they could not understand that planet, they called it Pandora, which means it's all chaos. It's Pandora. So the planet was labeled as Pandora by the reductionist scientists and technologists of the world. So they want to make an invasion and they want to destroy the two trees of the planet. First, the tree of life, which they destroyed. And second, it is Iowa, which is a tree of wisdom. And when all that happens, uh, James Cameron starts using the parables of Indian spirituality like Nabhi, Omati Kaya, and Tarak, the great bird Garuda in that movie. And symbolically, he shows a person who is raised to a higher level of consciousness. He is the avatar. And he intervenes from the earth consciousness into the planetary consciousness of Pandora, helps them to come out of it by the interconnectedness, by the signs of interconnectedness in that planet itself. So if you see the last 30 minutes of the movie, it's all about that, where the tribe in that society finally gets the support system of nature, mother nature. And mother nature takes over the destiny of the whole world. That is the whole movie called Avatar. So just look at this. Think very simply and think on yourself. A Western movie maker, James Cameron, had spent about 12 years, uh, I'm sorry, eight years of research with a team of 108, 108, 108, and came to Asia and had discovered all the syntaxes, vocabulary, and the syllables from Indian knowledge system, configured the storyboarding and the cinematography of this movie, and then made a movie called Avatar. So it's like a sadhana. We don't make a movie in just one month's preparation. It's so much of sadhana. And the Avatar is actually a movie which proves Ayurveda as a science, as a true science. So I don't want to come to a problem at the end of my system. So the West has already began to realize the greatness of Indian wisdom. It's high time that we Indians as a whole start realizing the greatness of Indian wisdom. This is my humble appeal to all of us, including I, including myself, so that we become more simple and humble to know the much larger wisdom. Are we connected? Not yet. So I think we have to take a decision, you know. Um, or otherwise, then, because. Uh, Five, seven minutes presentation, you can module it. I think I'm going to be from here. Mm -hmm. If we connect, then it will stop it. Oh, I mean, it's a
Who is the next president? The next person is online. So Gayatri Madam is here. But what are you doing? Okay, okay, okay. So I think we, uh, I give it to, I give it to Sir and Krishna to take over the stage. So time is very important. So we are trying to utilize the time uh, scientifically and judiciously. Uh, yes, now <coughs> the faculty member from School of Medical Science and Technology, IIT Khadakpur, they have shown their courage to describe how modern science and technology can be integrated, can be utilized, can be leveraged to understand the concepts of Ayurveda, the wisdom of Ayurveda. In, in medicine as a whole, immunology plays a great role. In the last few decades, only in the field of immunology, many scientists, they got the Nobel Prize. And it has expanded, extended the arena, the utility, applicability and understanding of human body in health and disease. That is the science of immunology. The professor Gayatri Mukherjee from the School of Medical Science and Technology, she is working for the last many years with training in India and abroad in the field of immunology, basic immunology as well as for the diseases. So she is trying to explore how we can interface the concept of immunology embedded in Ayurveda with a modern immunological concept. So we can say a kind of integrated concept we can develop regarding immunology to advance the cause of medicine. So Professor Gayatri Mukherjee. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? OK. So um, first of all, I want to thank you for having me here. Um, I was not supposed to talk right now, but uh, yeah, to fill up the gap. So basically, what I will talk about is, so as uh, Professor Chatterjee uh, already said, that I am an immunologist who have been working on various aspects of the very intricate science of immunology for the last about 18 years. And um, so, so what I have, but, but yes, I have, I have always been interested in this Indian knowledge system of Ayurveda because honestly, there are various studies that have actually validated a few principles of Ayurveda, especially I think already you heard uh, uh, Professor Mitali Mukherjee yesterday. Um, so uh, there are there is the concepts of the prakriti and uh, the ayurgenomics, which which are already being very nicely probed by using the molecular and uh, molecular and cellular tools, uh, modern tools actually. So uh, what I will discuss here is that what is immunology? So immunology itself is a very big orchestra, like uh, in an orchestra, there are so many different instruments and so many different people trying to, you know, they're all, uh, all contributing to the same tune. And if one of that instrument or one of the many people who are uh, playing one instrument somehow goes off key, the whole orchestra is, uh, you know, messed up. So it's a very tightly regulated, uh, and interdependent uh, process where which, which finally the, the outcome of which is to protect us from disease. So when we talk about disease, we usually think about pathogens of exogenous origins like 
virus, as we saw with the SARS-CoV-2, or different bacteria, fungi, parasites. However, pathogenic entities should not, cannot always be exogenous. They are also endogenous origin, like they're coming from the body itself. So what the, so if we look at this, so the uh, mammalian immune response. So again, we are very anthropocentric. So whenever we are talking about something, we are talking about humans only. At most, we are expanding to the mammals. But actually, immune response or disease resistance is not just a, a characteristic of mammals. It is found in invertebrates. It is found in the plants. And many, many things are actually quite homologous in plants as well as in animals and mammals and invertebrates. So what is the objective of the immune system? Is to try and you know, neutralize any threat that the body perceives as, uh, which, will, which will cause disturbances in the body. So if you look at the immune system, so you know, for the, for, so if I, if I talk about immunology as such, so in the ancient times, during the great scourges of mankind, like smallpox or plague, people did have an observation that uh, some, some people who survived one bout of the disease were usually exempt or immune to a second round of the disease. So these observational studies were actually the, you can say that it is the, like the very preliminary, very primitive idea of immune system. Over the last century or so, our modern understanding of, the, of how the body protects itself from exogenous as well as endogenous threats, it evolved. So, before that, people used to think that diseases are caused by sins. And then Robert Koch came in and he said that, no, see, these are caused by pathogens. And then, you know, uh, uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, Arlish, all of them actually showed so many different and very, very, you know, meticulous experiments which have actually, which, which caused, which made the foundation of the immune system. Immuno, science of immunology. And so as the time went by and our understandings were better and we could develop various uh, molecular and molecular tools to study the immune system, we found that the immune system is basically composed of several factors, some of which are dedicated to be uh, the effectors of the immune system or activators of the immune system. So the immune, whenever somebody gets sick, these effectors get upregulated, they get activated, and they actively work in a concerted manner like the, uh, like the orchestra, and it tries to get rid of the uh, pathogens. However, while doing so, what happens is that there is a, there is a, you know, uh, there is a flip side of everything. There is a cost of everything. So the cost of such protection is also if these protective responses, these activating effector responses, go on for a long time, are sustained for a long time, then there will be a very, uh, you know, side effects will be there. What kind of side effects? There will be tissue damage. And this tissue damage will lead to even more pathologies, which we call as immunopathology. So the immune system itself, which is our protectant, is now becoming our, the pathogenic entity also. So for that, we have some regulators of uh, regulatory mechanisms, regulatory, regulatory cells, and regulatory pathways. Shall I stop now? Sure, no problem. No problem. Deepra. बाबा जी बाबा जी प्रणाम हम आपको सुन पा रहे हैं जी दीपक जी 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 हम आपको सुन पा रहे हैं जी जी बिल्कुल बिल्कुल हम सभी यहां पे आपकी राह देख रहे थे इतनी देर से और हम आपको सुनने के लिए आतुर हैं बाबा जी जी मेरा बहुत-बहुत प्रणाम आप सभी को वंदे मातरम और यहां जो भारत की विरासत को आगे लेकर के और पूरे विश्व को रोगमुक्त बनाने का जो स्वप्न है संकल्प है रोगमुक्त हमारा तनमन जीवन हो 
प्रदूषण मुक्त हमारे स्वास्थ्य हो हमारा समाज हो प्रदूषण मुक्त हमारी हवाएं हो प्रदूषण तो अब बहुत बड़ा शब्द है आहार के स्तर पर विचार वाणी व्यवहार स्वभाव संबंधों के स्तर पर प्रदूषण तनाव बहुत गहरा आ गया है और आयुर्वेद जो है वो मात्र एक चिकित्सा पद्धति नहीं वो चिकित्सा पद्धति भी है क्योंकि आयुर्वेद और अमृता नाम आयुर्वेद से बड़ा कोई अमृत नहीं हम जो एलोपैथी के सिंगल ड्रग्स ले ले करके अपने लीवर किडनी हार्ट ब्रेन नर्वस सिस्टम को खराब कर रहे ये जो सिंगल ड्रग कॉन्सेप्ट है मैं आज इस बात को कह रहा हूं आप सब बहुत पढ़े लिखे लोग हैं मुझे ये कहते हुए गौरव है कि हमारे आईआईटी खड़गपुर से लेकर के जितने भी हमारे देश के प्रबुद्ध जन है वो इसके ऊपर विचार करें यह जो आयुर्धारा का आप एक संस्कृति मंत्रालय के संयुक्त तत्वाधान में जो आप कर रहे हैं एक विचार होना चाहिए इस बात के ऊपर हो सकता है इसका परिणाम आने में अभी एक दो दशक लग जाएगी दस बीस साल लेकिन सिंगल जो ड्रग का जो कॉन्सेप्ट है ये आपको तात्कालिक रूप से कुछ राहत दे सकता है चाहे वो पेनकिलर्स है चाहे स्टेराइड है चाहे वो बायोलॉजिकल्स हैं चाहे अलग अलग प्रकार के केमिकल्स और हारमोन्स हैं और व्यक्ति अपने आप में एक कोई केमिकल नहीं है या नॉट एक अवर बॉडी इज नॉट ए केमिकल बॉडी वी हैव केमिकल सॉस हारमोन्स वी हैव बॉडी वी हैव माइंड वी हैव थॉट्स वी हैव इमोशंस एंड मॉलिक्यूल्स ऑफ इमोशंस माने हम एक पूरा ब्रह्मांड है हम एक शरीर के रूप में पूरा ब्रह्मांड है और इसको हम केवल एक सिंगल मोलिक्यूल से हम ठीक करना चाहें वो तर्क संगत नहीं है न्याय संगत नहीं है दिस इज नॉट नेचुरल जस्टिस तो जो आयुर्वेद का कॉन्सेप्ट क्या है एक गिलोय में एक तुलसी में पांच सौ एक अश्वगंधा में पांच सौ से हजार फैटी केमिकल अब आप किसी की दर्जा देने या ना देने से कोई सच को जुटलाया नहीं जा सकता हमने मनुष्य ने जो पैरामीटर्स बनाए हुए आपने विवेक के अनुसार बनाए गए अब उसमें विज्ञान एक पक्ष रहता है लेकिन उसमें इंडस्ट्री दूसरा पक्ष होता है तो जितनी भी फार्मा इंडस्ट्री है उसके लिए नेचुरल जस्टिस नेचर एंड सस्टेनेबल हेल्थ दिस इज नॉट अल्टीमेट गॉड उनके लिए हर चीज का एक बाजार है उस बाजार का एक साइज है उसमें कितनी अपॉर्चुनिटी है पूरे वर्ल्ड की टॉप फिफ्टी कंपनियों का जो कारोबार है वो करीब नब्बे लाख करोड़ है टोटल करीब डेढ़ सौ लाख करोड़ का और इसमें फूड सप्लीमेंट्स को जोड़ दिया जाए तो दो दो सौ लाख करोड़ रुपए का है। अब उसमें हम ये सोचे कि हम केवल मेडिसिन से स्वस्थ बन जाएंगे तो मैं कोई मेडिसिन के ऊपर प्रहार नहीं कर रहा लेकिन एक ये बताना चाह रहा हूं कि जो योग है जो आयुर्वेद है जो पंचकर्म षटकर्म है जो प्रकृति के साथ एक सामंजस्य के साथ जीवन जीना है और इसमें भी एक बड़ा तत्व है आत्मनिर्भर आत्मनिर्भरता आरोग्य की आत्मनिर्भरता हर क्षेत्र में हमें जो परमात्मा ने प्रकृति ने जो ईश्वरवादी है या प्रकृतिवादी है कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता इसमें व्यवहारिक धरातल पर दोनों को सेम एक्शन में रहना पड़ता है हाँ ये तो जरूर है कि हम केवल जड़ सकता नहीं हम चैतन्य पहुंच सकता है इसलिए एक जो मध्यम मार्ग है वो ज्यादा व्यवहारिक दिखता है तो हम सब जो एक संकल्प लेकर के आगे बढ़ रहे हैं कि हर दिन हर घर आयुर्वेद हो और आयुर्वेद क्या है आयुर्वेद में योग भी समाहित है आयुर्वेद का जो महर्षि चरक शुष्क और धनवंती का जो पूरा कॉन्सेप्ट है उसमें योग उसके अंतर्निहित तत्व है जो नेचुरोपैथी उसके अंतर्निहित तत्व है तो ये अलग से कोई पैथिया नहीं है योग का कोई अलग से पैथी नहीं है नेचुरोपैथी कोई अलग से पैथी नहीं है ये सब आयुर्वेद के ही अंग उपांग है उसके अंगीभूत उसी के ही अवयव उसी के घटक है उसी की धाराएं है और इसी से ही पूरे दुनिया के स्वास्थ्य के और भारत की समृद्धि के द्वार खुलने की आगे पूरी एक बहुत बड़ी कल्पना है तो आप एक बहुत ऊंचे विचार के साथ आगे बढ़ रहे हैं और इस दिशा में 
विश्व की श्रेष्ठ प्रतिभाओं को और सोचना चाहिए जिस तरह से मनुष्य जिनको हम आज लाइफ स्टाइल डिजीज और वही जब क्रॉनिक हो जाए तो उनको बोलो पुरानी हो गई तो क्रॉनिक हो गई अब काबू में नहीं आ रही तो बोले इनकेबल हो गई अब तो बोले इसके भीतर के भी जो है जो जेनेटिक एक्सप्रेशन है वो भी होने लग गए अब इसके आर एन ए डी एन ए प्रोटीन का एक्सप्रेशन रॉन्ग डायरेक्शन में होने लग गया तो बोले जेनेटिक डिजीज हो गई तो इसके तो पूरी अंदर की इनर इंजीनियरिंग ही पूरी बिगड़ गई मेंटल के बाद फिर इमोशनल डिजीज भी हो गई अब ये अब हम जिनको बीमारियां नाम देकर के उनका उपचार करने की कोशिश करते हैं बाइपोल डिसऑर्डर है ओवर थिंकिंग है नेगेटिव थिंकिंग है और जो व्यक्ति फिर इनेक्शन रिएक्शन रोंग एक्शन डिस्ट्रेक्शन की तरफ चला जाता है हम रुकेंगे कहा तो योग आयुर्वेद और प्रकृति और संस्कृति के सनातन तत्व हमें अपने जड़ों से जोड़ने का काम करते हैं और ये हमें एक इंटीग्रेटेड और सस्टेनेबल हेल्थ प्रोवाइड करता है तो आयुर्वेद को जो मैंने जाना है अभी तक पिछले तीस वर्षों में हम उसका अभ्यास कर रहे हैं पांच सौ से ज्यादा इस पर रिसर्च पेपर छपे हैं और आपने देखा होगा स्टैंडफोर्ड यूनिवर्सिटी जो है और क्या है कौन सा एक एस जी स्टैंडफोर्ड यूनिवर्सिटी और जो है एक बहुत बड़ा प्रकाशन हाउस है उन्होंने मिलकर के टॉप के वर्ल्ड के टॉप टू परसेंट साइंटिस्टों की सूची में पतंजलि को पूज्य आचार्य वार्षण जी को सम्मिलित किया तो कार्य हमारा इसी दिशा में चल रहा है कि पांच से ज्यादा हमने जो रिसर्च पेपर छापे क्योंकि हमारे देश के श्रद्धे प्रधानमंत्री जी आए थे जब पतंजलि रिसर्च सेंटर के उद्घाटन पर तो उन्होंने एक ही बात अपनी कही थी कि साक्ष्य आधारित क्लिनिकल कंट्रोल ड्राइव बेस्ड ऑफ मेडिशन प्रोवाइड कराएं तो वर्ल्ड जब उसको मेडिशन का दर्जा दे उस दिशा में हमने आज जो लीवर किडनी फेलियर के लिए हार्ट फेलियर के लिए अलग अलग बीमारियों के लिए पार्किसन के लिए अल्जाइमर के लिए जो एक प्रामाणिकता से काम किया है वो अपने आप में अप्रतिम है तो हम जहा अभी आधुनिक चिकित्सा में जहां अभी वो लोग अभी पूरी तरह से उनको दृष्टि भी साफ नहीं कि लीवर फेलियर से आप फैटी लीवर है लीवर सोरेसिस हेपेटाइटिस इससे कैसे बचाया जाए उसकी मुक्ति के उपाय हमारे पास हमने ये किया है लिवोग्रिट लिवामृत आदि उसमें रिस्क जो है क्लिनिकल कंट्रोल पर आधारित पूरे पूरे साक्ष्य आधारित पूरी तथ्यों के साथ प्रमाणों के साथ किडनी फेलियर के लिए रिनोग्रिट से लेकर के और फिर हार्ट के लिए तो बहुत सिंपल सी चीजें हैं कोई लंबी चौड़ी कहानी नहीं है दो महीने के अंदर इलेक्शन इन्फेक्शन बीस पच्चीस से लेकर के साठ पैंसठ सत्तर तक पहुंच जाता है विद इन टू मंथ्स ब्लॉकेज रिवर्स हो जाते हैं या तो पोलियोट आर्टरी तैयार हो जाती है मेन आर्टरीज खुल जाती है बड़ी चीजें तीन बातें कह करके मैं अपनी बात खत्म करता हूं अभी तक यू माना जाता था मॉडर्न मेडिकल साइंस में कि आप ब्रेन के आंखों के कानों के लीवर किडनी के और लंग के हार्ट के यहां तक कि बोन्स के सेल्स को रिज्यूवनेट नहीं कर सकते हमने ये रिज्यूवनेशन हर लेवल पर करके दिखाया और इस पर अब पूरी दुनिया में एक नए विमर्श को स्थान मिला नई विमर्श ने एक तरह से जन्म लिया कि हम रिज्यूनेट कर सकते हैं अपने बॉडी के ब्रेन के डिफरेंट सेल्स को दूसरी चीज लगभग लाइफस्टाइल डिजीज के बारे में जो बोला जाता है कि आप इनको कंट्रोल कर सकते हैं वी हैव नॉट क्योर लेकिन हमने वी हैव क्योर हाइपरटेंशन डायबिटीज के पेशेंट्स को हमने नोट आउट किया और ये तमाम जिनको हम लाइफस्टाइल डिजीज कह करके कहते रहे थे जिंदगी भर दवा था ये कौन सा खसाना है हमने अरे लाइफस्टाइल अच्छा कर लो तो लाइफस्टाइल डिजीज कहा रहेगी तो हमने बीपी के पेशेंटों की जो 10 10 20 20 साल से गोलियां खा रहे थे पिछले 10 10 20 20 साल से गोलियां बंद है तब इसे बड़ा प्रमाण क्या हो डायबिटीज टाइप वन डायबिटीज जो टाइप टू डायबिटीज बहुत सामान्य है उसको तो अब ऐसे हजारों लोगों को डेटा हमारे पास है जिनको टाइप टू डायबिटीज और टाइप वन डायबिटीज के भी सैकड़ों लोगों की डेटा पिछले दो दो तीन तीन साल से जिनका 100 परसेंट शुगर रेगुलेट 
माने जिनको सौ सौ यूनिट लेना पड़ता था उसमें से कुछ तो बालक मेरे यहाँ आकर के पढ़ रहे हैं अभी यूनिवर्सिटी एक किशन बालक है गुजरात का उसका तो स्प्लेन बढ़ गया था लिवर फंक्शन भी गड़बड़ हो गया था और पेंट्रियाटाइटिस भी था साथ में डायबिटीज और इंसुलेंट सौ से ज्यादा अब वो उसका फाइव फाइव पॉइंट फाइव एस बी एम सी रहता ऐसे तो ये दिस इज वन एग्जाम्पल तो हम बीमारियों को कंट्रोल ही क्योर कर सकते हैं और ये आयुर्वेद मतलब केवल एक चिकित्सा पद्धति नहीं एक जीवन पद्धति है जो महर्षि चरक्ष ने जो स्वस्थ वृत्त कहा तो आयुर्वेद जो है वो प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन भी है सेकेंडरी प्रिवेंशन भी है एक्यूट मैनेजमेंट के भी बहुत तौर तरीके हमारे पास में क्योर भी है इसमें रिहेबिटेशन भी है पेलिएशन भी है सबसे बड़ा बड़ी बात इसमें सस्टेनेबल हेल्थ है वी आर नॉट प्रोवाइडिंग ओनली फिजिकल हेल्थ वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग थ्रू आयुर्वेदा फिजिकल मेंटल इमोशनल एंड स्पिरिचुअल हेल्थ एंड कंप्लीट एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ आवर लाइफ तो ये इतने बड़े तत्व हैं हमें तो साथ में लेकर के चलेंगे तो पूरे विश्व को हम चिकित्सा में एक नई दिशा दे पाए दरअसल होता क्या है कि जो प्रचलित अवधारणाएं हैं उनके उनसे विपरीत कोई बोलता है तो लोग उसको विद्रोही करार दे करके विरोधी करार दे करके या उसको जो है उसको इग्नोर करके और ये साबित करना चाहते हैं कि नहीं हम ही जो करने वो ठीक है तो मुझे लगता है आप लोग तो बहुत विवेकी हैं और आप सब लोग इस दिशा में आगे किसी न किसी तरह से अपने अपने सर पर सहयोग करेंगे तो आयुर्वेद का भी पुनर्जागरण होगा भारत भी जागरण के नए दौर से गुजर रहा है और पूरी हमारी सनातन संस्कृति एक नई शिखर पर आरोपित तो होगी मैं एक बार पुनः आदरणीय श्री दीपक किसरानी जी का जो हमारे निदेशक हैं आजादी के अमृत महोत्सव संस्कृति मंत्रालय के और श्रद्धे प्रधानमंत्री जी का जो मोदी साहब का सपना है कि हम गुलामी की निशानियों को मिटाते चले अभी गुलामी की निशानियां इतना करारा शब्द है अब इसमें आर्थिक गुलामियां भी हैं शिक्षा चिकित्सा की गुलामियां हैं वैचारिक गुलामियां हैं संस्थाएं हैं है। अलग अलग प्रकार की सामाजिक और राजनीतिक गुलामियों के अलग अलग जो है हम पापों को ढोते जा रहे हैं अब कम से कम एक साहसी प्रधानमंत्री देश में है जो कहता है कि गुलामी की निशानियों से बाहर निकलो और आजादी के अमृत महोत्सव से पर कुछ ऐसा अमृत मंथन करो कि हम अपने विरासत के गौरव को लेकर के आगे बढ़े और बहुत बड़ी विरासत हमारी योग है आयुर्वेद है हमारी इन सनातन सांस्कृतिक विरासतों को लेकर के हम आगे बढ़ेंगे तो निश्चित रूप से भारत अपने परम वैभव को अपना प्राप्त होगा मैं आदरणीय श्री डॉक्टर अणव हाजरा जी का भी जो आई जी खड़गपुर से ही है आप सबका हृदय से अभिनंदन करता हूँ और जितने भी श्रोता हमारे साथ में जुड़े हैं आप सब सुधी जनों का बहुत प्रज्ञावान प्रतिभावान सभी दिव्य आत्माओं को हृदय से प्रणाम करता हूँ आप कि इस अनुष्ठान में मैंने कहा था मैं थोड़ी देर के लिए जरूर सम्मिलित होऊंगा दीपक जी बहुत बहुत प्रणाम है हाँ धन्यवाद बाबा जी आपने आज बड़ा प्रसंगोचित व्याख्यान किया है और बहुत सारी वैज्ञानिक भूमिकाओं पर आपने अपनी बात को रखी है तो हम आप, 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 हमारी कृतज्ञता व्यक्त करते हैं आपके प्रति और जो बड़ा काम आपने बड़ा मिशन लिया है और उसको उसके लिए आपको बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं एवं हम हम मंगल कामनाएं करते हैं कि इसकी सफलता हम देख ही रहे हैं और भी अनेक सब ज़्यादा सफलता इस काम को प्राप्त हो ऐसी हम शुभकामना करते हैं धन्यवाद नाउ देर इज अ बिग पैनल डिस्कशन सो आई आई विल आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल ऑल द पैनलिस्ट ऑन द डायस एंड देन या शी इज अ पार्ट ऑफ द पैनल सर शील बी कंटिन्यूइंग so i request uh, dr danish zafar dr sanjeev kumar samanta dr arnab dre uh, of course dr gayatri mukherjee professor santanu dhara professor somen das professor devjani chakravarti will be online with us dr tushar kanti mandal 
and Dr. Sumit Sur to please come on the dais as a part of the panel. And I request Dr. Gayatri Mukherjee to please, uh, and I apologize also uh, for creating this. And I ask, I, I request her to please continue her presentation. So, uh, we are inviting Professor Joy Sen, myself, and uh, Dipesh, Dr. Dipesh, to coordinate this panel discussion. Yes. <coughs> I take the kind permission from the very esteemed panel. Uh, I think our first humble and noble duty is to allow Professor Gayatri Mukherjee to complete the paper which was interrupted. Yeah, and we are extremely sorry for that. So it's over to Professor Mukherjee and she invokes the whole panel discussion and the rest is followed with the guidance from Professor Shomen Das and Professor Chatterjee. Madam. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, so no, I didn't really mind anything. It's fine. I mean, we really got to hear from uh, Ramdev ji about uh, his thoughts on this day. And um, so I think if I'm uh, going to, maybe I, I should uh, continue with the uh, discussion. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt Professor Mukherjee again. Actually, this panel discussion uh, is a form of discussion. We are trying to present some idea in the context of scientific evidences or scientific wisdom of Ayurveda and how that can be appreciated or advanced using the modern science and technology including modern medical wisdom and the techniques. So in this direction, uh, we are organizing this, uh, uh, this panel discussion. So first speaker, uh, Professor Mukherjee, she will first complete, then we will continue. Thank you, sir. Um, so yeah, so um, as I was telling you about the science of immunology and how it evolved through the uh, ages, and now what we know about the immune system is that it is not only, it is not all right just to have processes or methods to combat the pathogens because sustained activation of the immune cells and molecules will be actually causing a very tremendous deleterious side effect of tissue damage. So in order to stop that or in order to regulate that tissue damage, the, there are mechanisms and uh, there are mechanisms which includes different molecules and cells that participate in the same to try and put the whole thing into balance. So as you can see here, these are the effectors. The green ones are the effectors, which basically gives a go signal, a green signal to the immune response. And the regulators, which are, uh, uh, which are the red balls, these are the stop signal, which tells the immune system to stop at the correct time. So it is a very important thing to have a correct balance of the immune system. And so what happens if that immune system balance is disturbed? The first thing is that if there are more regulators, means that there are the stop signals, the stop signals are more, which will tell the immune response to stop. So 
in our body there are there are mechanisms to be that that can recognize and respond to abnormal cells like the cancer cells however when the body the when those mechanisms don't work properly that means when the stop signals are stronger than the go signals then there is a disbalance and people develop cancer on the other hand if there is a disbalance on the other side means that there are more go signals more effectors than the stop signals then what we have are the different autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes like rheumatoid arthritis thyroiditis lupus so on and so forth which are very very uh, important and very very difficult diseases to manage now if we uh, go for the so so you know so the uh, the field now feels that immune homeostasis which is the balance of the immune system is very important and as i as i was saying that even though the science of immune immunology evolved over the last 100 or so years the last couple of decades have been more eye opening to the field because of the discovery of different molecular tools which have been able to go into details at the single cell level and tell us very important uh, important uh, uh, information about how the immune system is regulated so when the immune system regulation is actually thought about there are several components that need to be taken into account so the, the, those include a good amount of nutrition not just amount the correct nutrition the correct amount of exercise not too much not too low then a completely healthy lifestyle which means having to you know going to sleep at the proper time eating the proper food thinking about good things and all that and of course the circadian rhythm you, there are already posters outside which talks about the circadian rhythm and professor shane also talked about that so you know with our night shifts and our uh, our propensity to watch movies on netflix at the at the middle of the night that circadian rhythm is being completely messed up and all these things are very important when we think about immune homeostasis one of the important another important thing is the removal of stress so you know as uh, professor shen was again talking about the reductionist uh, uh, reductionist approaches we are always very stressed out about how to be the best among all others not to be best versions of other of ourselves alone we have to be best among others so all these competitive mentalities also causing a lot of stress in us even in little children are coming and telling that they are stressed another important thing is the commensal microbiome so as we know that our body is not just us our cells are outnumbered by a factor of 10 by different microbes that are present inside our body and they are not just present there they are actually helping to shape the immune system so all these factors are very important when we think about immune homeostasis now why i talked about immunology which is a very modern science when i'm talking when i'm here talking about uh, you know uh, participating in a panel discussion on ayurveda so all these things are actually very reminiscent about of the factors that are talked about in the ayurveda so in the ayurveda we are always we what we know i mean i know very little of ayurveda but what i understand is that it is not just one organ one disease and of one particular molecule it is about the holistic approach the whole system the body is looked out looked at as a system rather than a collection of different organs and this is what we are learning in immunology as well so in the uh, few like uh, few decades back we talked about we learned about the innate cells the t cells b cells macrophages but now our as our understanding again got clearer because of the different molecular tools and everything we know that it is not just the immune cells it is the lymph it is the endothelial cells the epithelial cells the skin the microbiome all are coming together to take part in the immune regulation and thus you know maintain the immune homeostasis even the mucosal layer which is the inner lining of all our organs and is the gateway of many pathogens to get in 
So this mucosal layer has a viscosity, has a, a elasticity and its thickness. All these are important. So whenever these are disturbed for various reasons, then we get infections, we get different diseases. So if we go back to the Ayurvedic concepts, so what we find is that in Ayurveda, they're, they're, they have the concepts of immunology like uh, Vedic Shamatva. That is what we call as the immune system. That is what denotes the immune system. It translates as the factors which limit disease pathogenesis and regulate the magnitude of any disease. So basically it is the cellular and molecular components of the immune system. So why, again, why I'm talking about this is because I want to, want, want to uh, convey this that Ayurvedic concepts of immunology was jo not just an observational concept. It went far deeper in that because you will see that how these concepts have a parallel in modern science also. So this, uh, they, they did talk about Vadi, vadi utpada, Utpadaka Pratibandha Katva, which means that the prevention of occurrence and reoccurrence of disease. So this is exactly reflective of what we, what, of the concepts of recognition. So immun, immunology has very strong concepts of disease recognition. So first and foremost, you have to recognize the pathogen. Then you have to mount response to that specific response, not just a very genericness response, but a very specific response. And what is most important is the immunological memory. So this immunological memory actually helps to protect from successive inf infections, like the, if the same organ, same pathogen attacks us, then the immunological memory is something that will help mount a strong response to clear the, clear the uh, pathogen and not cause the disease. So this is exactly, uh, this is almost reflective of the Vadi Utpadaka uh, Pratibandha Katva. The next thing, the next concept in the Ayurvedic uh, treatise is the Vadi Valaviroditvam, which means that so the disease has happened, but how to withstand the disease virulence? So, you know, as we know that diseases, you know, like you saw in the, uh, in, the, in the time of Corona, a lot of people suffered a lot, a lot of people didn't. And yes, there was some uh, correlation between uh, uh, the age, comorbidities and all that. But the, if we go deeper and deeper, the correlation was very much, you know, like, very small, small uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in certain genes caused a lot of effect or caused, uh, caused a lot of differences in how the patient would respond to the uh, disease. So similar, uh, similar uh, uh, concepts are now being, are also being uh, discussed in the modern science of immunology, which is the disease tolerance. So first is the disease resistance, which is to try and stop the disease. And the other is the disease tolerance. So when a disease has developed, so how do you, so as I said, that if there is a mounting immune, mount, immune response is mounted in a very sustained manner, there will be a lot of damages. So our body has the mechanisms to reprogram itself, reorient itself to try and induce tolerance to the disease. So this is by doing metabolic reprogramming or, uh, you know, uh, like crosstalk between the, uh, between the common cells and the immune system which shapes the disease tolerant mechanisms. Then there are other concepts like the, so in, in, in Ayurveda, immunity is uh, manifested as bala. So the bala are, there are, again, they are making, in, in the Ayurvedic treatises, they are making different, uh, they, are, they are bringing forth different concepts like sahaj bala, bala, which is the primary immune, immune response, a primary power of immunity that is present in us, which is what we talk about in innate responses. So people are born with these responses and they are, they, so some of these, and innate responses are very important, you know, like the mechanical barriers, the pH of the stomach, the, uh, the different, uh, uh, you know, different cells of the innate immune response. All these are very linked to this uh, Sahaj Bala. 
Then we have the uh, college bala, which is which which they are talking about an acquired immunity, which is dependent on environmental factors also like climate. This is the Ayurvedic concept. The parallel concept in the modern immunological uh, discuss immunological discussions is the concept of adaptive immunity. So. Children, like when we are born, we are born with the innate, some innate responses we are born with, which stays throughout our life same, like they don't change. But the adaptive immune response is something that change according to the pathogen that has invaded us. So when a pathogen invades, particular cells are selected to respond to that. So that is kind of reflective or kind of a parallel to the Kalajabala. The other one is the Yuktikritavala which is an artificial immunity, which is imparted by the food we eat, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, exercises that we do, and uh, our healthy, healthy lifestyle in, in, uh, in, in some. So now we have a whole field of study called nutritional immunology. So it is not just about having all the good cells, having all the good genes. You may be good, you may be born with some very good genes that are very protective, very strong SNP, single nuclear polymorphisms. But if you do not have a good nutrition, you are going for high fat, high sugar diets, then all those balances will be lost, that immune homeostasis will be lost. So see, there are always parallels in the in the in the in the concept of in the ayurvedic concepts and the modern immunological concepts now what so there are certain things that are already seen like we can already see that there are these are the parallels these are the overlaps between our modern understanding and our uh, you know the the ancient ayurvedic understanding However, there are certain gaps also, right? So like we do not know what are these and how do we interpret it with the molecular tools or modern tools. So one of that is the concept of ojas. So ojas is like, you know, it is present in the body. That is what imparts the uh, immunity. And, uh, but what is the, so there, there, there are actually a lot of literature, like Sanskrit, uh, Ayurvedic literature, which talks about ojas, how does it look like? What are the different physical characteristics? And what are the different chemical characteristics? But at the, at the same time, uh, there are, they are uh, like, we do not, uh, we, as of now, we have not been able to find a parallel to the force of ojas. Like, what is the physical manifestation of ojas? So these are the points. And these are the points that are still gaps in our knowledge. And, uh, but I, will, I would like to tell you here that there are, uh, in the modern, in, in the last few years, there have been, a, have been several studies which have actually b uh, been able to investigate different Ayurvedic concepts like the uh, Prakriti, the Bata, Pitta and Kapha Prakriti with using different molecular tools like, you know, there is a, a paper where there are works which shows that people can be segregated according to the Prakritis when we look at the biochemical and hematological perspectives. They have uh, even looked at different uh, DNA methylation patterns, which is a very important and very modern concept. The different DNA methylation patterns have also been able to, uh, people have been able to link the DNA methylation patterns to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, different prakritis. So all these things need to be done. I mean, we are not yet there where we can integrate Ayurvedic uh, knowledge to our current understanding of immunology. But we are, we should, already work is being done and more work needs to be done, needs to be presented in such a manner that the whole world will look at it, whole world will accept it. Like it should be very, you know, thorough and very scientifically done with, a, with an open mind. So with that, I will conclude my uh, <laughs> discussion. I hope uh, I made some sense here today. So thank you, uh, Professor Mukherjee, for your nice discussion. And uh, it is nice that she has tried to appreciate <coughs> different dimensions of the concept in immunology of the Ayurveda and try to draw the parallel and also connectivity interconnectivity and now the people are trying to understand the nutrigenomics also to how nutrition can modulate our uh, genomic expressions and also she mentioned that immunology and another just in brief I should mention 
what she was telling about the Bhaipitta Kapha and all the experts, they mentioned the Prakriti concept in Ayurveda and Guna concept, Satta Rajatama. If we want to draw the parallel, there was a discussion from Professor Dibjani Chakraborty, how we can apply the fuzzy logic. Um, uh, what Professor Somesh Kumar has discussed, the utility of the I statistics and probability and also relevant mathematics in understanding or making, bringing precision in Ayurveda in that context to, to appreciate, to realize the reality of Ayurvedic concept, the intersections. Also in modern medicine, uh, modern medical researchers giving more importance to understand the ambiguity or the overlapping. So Faji logic, <coughs> it is a very important one. Uh, but Professor Devjani Chakraborty today he is not able to come here. So later on we shall discuss. Now we are inviting uh, Professor <coughs> Santanu Dhara. See, he is the expert in the field of biomaterials and tissue engineering. Very eminent scientist, recognized in the world. Uh, the two percent of the Stanford University had this ranking. And uh, he has contribution uh, in the field of tissue engineering, biomaterials. So we requested him to say something about the, our traditional, our old age or Ayurvedic time, the uh, metallurgy and the utility of the metallurgical procedure in the development of the new instruments for Ayurvedic practices. So Professor Santanu Dhara. Thank you, Professor Chatterjee, for nice introduction. And uh, thank you, Professor Sen and all others for having me here. It is a great opportunity for me to talk in front of such a uh, wonderful audience. Yeah. So I think my topic is revisiting surgical instruments used in the Ayurveda era. So as you understand the surgical instrument, right? So there are... Um, um, I think there are consequences because of that. I think uh, there was a need, uh, there was a uh, requirement of surgery. So I think quickly I will go through some of the. I think uh, I think one point I would like to mention here that Indian civilization is one of the oldest and continuous civilization. That I think everybody agrees to that. And perhaps we have certain habits which still continued. Perhaps, again I'm saying so, and which may be good, may be bad. So I think we need to reevaluate and recheck. Maybe scientifically you have to judge. We may have to continue, you may have to uh, modify. So I'm just talking about such habits. So uh, I think one is about the pan and chuna, right? We know the betel quids we take very often. Throughout the country, if you move around, then you will see that there is a stain of, or there is a mark of betel quids. So it may be good, may be bad, and I think uh, we need to test. And there are certain good part maybe in the pond. And, uh, and also we know that because of betel quid, there is a stain in the dental uh, crowns. So uh, dental crowns are prone to dental caries. As you know, there is a loss of calcium. It may give you some corrosion or erosion. Uh, because of the calcium loss, because we take many times sour food to uh, to restore the pH of the oral cavity, there is always a calcium loss. And in our food habit, as you know that towards the end of our dish, we take uh, kind of uh, sour food. So maybe uh, after the food, if you take pan and chuna, perhaps we restore some of the calcium. Again, it's a debatable uh, subject whether it is good or bad. But as we understand, if you have a stain on the dental crown, so basically the reversibility of the calcium uh, loss would be perhaps minimized. But it may not be good as well uh, uh, for certain aspects. I think we need to check that. So along with that, as you know that uh, we have very often studied about Surponaka and Lakshmana story where um, I think uh, Lakshmana punished Surponaka by removing the nose and the ear. So I think those days there was a capital punishment where you know very often they used to remove the nose, and of course uh, with the disfigured faces it is very difficult to uh, I think appear in the uh, in the I think in the public. 
So there are, uh, again, the effort and chances can be taken by the people who has knowledge, little but uh, maybe in the knowledge in, in terms of maybe Ayurveda or maybe medicine. And um, so here, uh, as also we know that zinc extraction is another remarkable story uh, in India, which was perhaps done in BC. So maybe I'll just talk about that. And also Damascus steel and Ostodhatu, copper vessel, as well as water preservation. Uh, I think not water preservation, water uh, container, water storing the water in the container. So carbon black, I think very often we have used carbon black for uh, different uh, way, for example, using a, as a cousin or maybe putting on a uh, eyes on the forehead of the uh, children. So as you know, so there are different materials we have explored. So eventually when we are talking about surgical tools or surgeries, also there are materials and tools which has to be, uh, I think we should have enough knowledge to uh, work on that. Definitely uh, Indian subcontinent also uh, highly explored those knowledges and the methods and they have also developed the tools. So I'll just talk about those in the context. So um, as you know, the Romans um, have used uh, the cow dung cake as for uh, cleaning their teeth. So similarly, even today you'll see in the village side in India that people are cleaning their teeth by cow dung cake ace or maybe uh, neem, babul, charcoal, salt, and different bosmos. So um, if you look at, at modern days, Colgate, for example, toothpaste, you will see that gradually, I mean, initially they have come up and they have removed those conventional thing and they are saying paste is the best. But slowly you see that they are adding neem, they are adding babul, they are adding charcoal, adding salt, and they are saying, okay, so if you add salt, antibacterial, add silver, antibacterial, then you see that they says that if you add silica into it, it will be better uh, rubbing and cleaning the uh, dental uh, crown. Similarly, if you add, say, uh, for example, the charcoal, it may give you the distending effect in the crown. So with that, I think we would move into the next slide. So as you know, the Alexander and Porus, uh, King Porus stories, that uh, Alexander was, uh, I think uh, King Porus was defeated by Alexander. And in that battle, uh, Alexander captured King Porus and asked, how do you treat me? So then he said, treat me as a king, so because I'm a king. So then Alexander was quite pleased and he released uh, King Porus, then King Porus given a gift. So that gift uh, was brought in a gold container where a chunk of iron. So perhaps in the history, first European who was seeing the iron. So this iron was actually extracted in um, Telangana. And if you see that actually the wood steel which was actually going to the uh, Middle East where they have processed into different type of uh, tools. For example, you can see here, this is a wood steel based, uh, uh, you can say the a knife. And this knife had a very interesting property. Uh, as you have seen the samurai sword in Japan. So they are very hard as well as flexible. And you can see the texture here. So. Um, those days, I think we did not have any microscope and transmission electron microscope or electron, uh, electron microscope. However, by the knowledge and by putting proper impurities into the uh, ingot, so they, were, they developed such a microstructure in the steel has given this kind of extraordinary properties. So if you look at the next slide, so, um, so I, I think Today, I think very recently, maybe five, six months back, I have gone through a literature. It says that uh, only few milligram of wood steel was synthesized by some group of scientists uh, in America. So you can imagine where India used to make this kind of steel in bulk, this whole knowledge is lost now. So I will show you one very interesting uh, article which was published in Nature in 2006. It shows that wood steel has a, um, I think you can see the microstructure here, you can see the carbon nanotubes all around the grain, which is giving us such a very uh, interesting property, which is 
rust place as well as which is giving us very uh, ductile as well as very hard uh, and uh, interesting property which is a, uh, keeping the edge for very long time without losing the sharpness. So this uh, again you can see that this actually literature uh, shows that this group of scientists from Germany they have actually uh, published this. So this is quite interesting but the wood still we I think we have still a lot of um, um, raw material so perhaps we could have also explored to uh, to to analyze the possibility but the major problem is that we do not we have lost the uh, technology i can say because now nobody is able to make such bulk amount of wood steel uh, in the whole uh, universe so this is again another example iron iron pillar as you know so it is there for i think about 1000 years now and it is rustless it is not forming a rust. Again, a scientist from IIT Kanpur has shown that, I think I'm not going into that. So uh, he has shown that the phosphate hydrate, which is, so basically iron phosphate hydrate layer is on the top, which is actually giving a protective layer, which is actually, uh, you know, kind of resisting the corrosion property. So again, Dr. Bal Subramaniam from IIT Kanpur, he has published this paper. He has shown that just because of this reach in phosphate and the iron is making such kind of interesting uh, uh, structure which is rust, uh, rustless. So one interesting part is that as you see the iron pillar, such a huge pillar and very often people have debated that how they placed it vertically. That was also a uh, big thing and how they made it such a huge pillar at that era. So basically they have perhaps done the hot forging and while they are forging, they have used, they have actually made a platform where they used to stand and they used to hot force and later on perhaps they removed the platform uh, so that, you know, it is there uh, as a pillar. So I think next, um, uh, I think I will be showing the next uh, slide which is showing the Konarok Sun Temple. So as you know that Konarok Sun Temple had a big, big uh, stone blocks which are actually um, which are actually bound by the iron bars. You look at the iron bar size, which was made perhaps thousand years back and then very interesting uh, method they have used. They have used, I will tell quickly. So uh, perhaps they have used small, small iron bars and they have hot forced again. So they have used the fracture mechanics concept. I think that that time, at that time, perhaps fracture mechanics concept was not there even. So, but by the knowledge, they have realized that if we can join the small, small block, so uh, I think that crack can be deviated, crack, crack path length can be increased, so that way perhaps they can make more toughness into the steel. Yeah, so then, um, so quickly I'll go into the uh, zinc extraction, I think uh, they have already found in the uh, Rajasthan Johar mines. So I think I'll quickly go into a uh, uh, couple of slides on evidence of uh, some example of the surgical tools. So here as you see here Ostodhatu and uh, the copper container very often used in India for storing the food as well as the water. So I remember when I was doing my postdoc in University of uh, Birmingham, my colleague uh, mentioned we Indian eat by the hand. So I was <laughs> just mentioning, so we use the, uh, we use the uh, kind of ring and in ring may have metal uh, like silver, gold, maybe platinum. And today we see there are uh, plenty of literature says that silver nanoparticle, gold nanoparticle, um, um, platinum nanoparticle, these are all antimicrobial. And sometimes you see there are, I think 2005 to say 12, I can see at least 10 patents on silver nanoparticle based wood dressing materials. So as you imagine that when you are eating by hand and your hand has a say silver ring, so you are rubbing and continuously perhaps silver particles are produced and which is going into the uh, cavity uh, along with the food. So that may be uh, one of the uh, interesting way to explain. I do not know, perhaps they have not explored that much, but there are goods and bads. Maybe this is one of the way to explain that. There are some good points. So another thing is that uh, the copper vessels, for example, so if you look at the copper vessels, I think Nottingham University has done a very unique experiment. They have kept the, reserved the water in a plastic container and the 
copper container. What they have seen over the time, uh, copper container had a bacteria concentration reduced with time, whereas in the plastic container it was increasing. That was a very unique experiment. It shows that plastic container, uh, uh, copper container has a copper ion which is actually killing the bacteria. I think today if you see in Nottingham University, uh, uh, Imperial College, many institute in India, abroad, Western or American universities, they are working on nanoparticles and heavy metals for incorporation into uh, different materials for uh, hypoxic uh, uh, condition for making angiogenic model or making accelerating the bone regeneration and so on. So today, as you know that, uh, so we use different Vosmos also for different applications. So all the Vosmos, uh, as you as you know, these are actually of Ayurvedic origin. So they have used different type of minerals and they have burned into powders and the residues always will have certain inorganic or organic, sorry, inorganic or metallic ions and that or the oxides or phosphates or sulfates and these have certain, um, uh, they have certain uh, effects. Yeah. So uh, I think as I mentioned about the capital punishment, so I can just quickly go into uh, some of the tools. You can see here, these are the tools which are developed by Susruto. And as you know, perhaps we had a profound knowledge of metallurgy as we have shown some of the examples. So due to that, perhaps they are able to uh, make certain tools. That tools are definitely helpful for doing some surgeries. As you see here, I think yesterday I was just searching, I found perhaps some people say, China, but perhaps India is the first to do the cataract surgery. Uh, uh, I think cataract surgery was done by Susruto. So you can see that this is the tools which was developed by uh, Susruto, and you can see the modern age tool. So I think we can see the design wise not very much different. And of course, the composition may have changed, but I can see the design and the sole uh, material is actually the iron. So actually all the tools apply the liver, liver rules. So you can see the tools, some tools are longer, some tools are shorter. And uh, so that depending on the type of levers they have used for different purposes. So uh, I think there are, as you know, there are three class of levers. Uh, uh, one is called type one, type two, and type three. So type one can have different efficacy. For example, um, I think depending on the load and effort, so uh, you can have efficacy one or less than one or equal to one. But type two always has more efficacy and type three has less efficacy. So that way I think there are different tools, uh, different levers are used for making the surgical tools. And again, uh, uh, perhaps they did not have, or maybe they had the knowledge of liver rule, we do not know, but we understand that the tools which are used, they are very much aligned with the uh, liver uh, rules. Yeah, so uh, I think just two slides, I'll talk very quickly. So as you see here, this is a, again example from the ancient time, you see there is a scar in the forehead. So this scar, um, as you know, there are uh, capital punishment where they remove the nose and for socialization, so you need to reconstruct the nose. So what they have done, perhaps they have had cut this kind of skin and they have reconstructed. And as you see here, so this is the design. So uh, if you look at modern day rhinoplasty, I think which is very much similar. Which, and uh, so this is the last slide. So I, what I'd like to show you here that you can see nowadays, people are using very modern or advanced concept of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. They're using, making the, using the materials and making the uh, different tissues, maybe at the side or maybe in vitro. And then they're grafting into the human and they are getting really wonderful uh, results. Perhaps the knowledge of Susuto was the precursor for today's development. I think with this, I would like to thank for uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dhara, for your nice discussion that what we had in ancient time in metallurgy and its impact and also engineering, I should say, in the development of the surgical tools. So now we have uh, 
less time, we have to manage it. So uh, we are requesting now uh, Professor Danis Jaffer. He is the professor of Kolkata Unani Medical College. And uh, he has extensive research experience, teaching and research experience. And we know the Unani, the Greco-Arabian Arabian medicine now entered into India for the last many decades and interacted with Ayurveda. And it has strong connectivity with Ayurveda in terms of concept, in terms of use of different techniques and medicines. So Professor Danish Jaffer very briefly will try to develop uh, the connect between the Ayurvedic concepts and Ayurveda, Ayurveda and Unani, particularly in the herbal medicine. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Unani and Ayurveda is a natural and scientific system of medicines. Unani is belongs to the Greco Arab or Ionian medicines. Uh, Yunnan, now we know the country of the Greek. Some ancient Yunani physician had introduced the Yunani system of medicines, and Ayurveda is the Indian system of medicine. Also, Yunani is uh, under the branch of the ISM Indian system of medicine. Yunani, when a god create the universe, four things is required, where four things is a air, is a soil, or water, and fire. A four things required for the creation of the nature, where according to the Yunani system of medicine, a four things is required for the growth of the and formation of the and creation of the nature. We know or our Yunani system, uh, one thing is a very important, ki when God uh, create a human, four things is required according to Allama Nafis, he told ki when we form a pot, we need some soil. When we uh, want to shape the soil, we re need required a water. When we mix the water and soil, we form like a paste. And that paste, after we want to give the shape for the pot, we need some air. And with air, we form a shape. When we form a pot, a thin pot, we need some strongness some mustahkam, some mazbuti kuch aisa, some needs, so we need fire. Four things is a, uh, required for the formation or uh, for the human. So that things we see the elements or arcan in Yunani system of medicine, also in the Ayurveda we have. When a baby develop in a intrauterine life or in embryology, so in our Quran told Surah Al Imran ki we have one drop of water means semen and develop at in two khuliyat means blastocyst and after that we multiply and divide and multiply and form a ten cell of the uh, babies is a uh, blastocyst. And we developed like uh, some mazaga means a, ma a part of the muscles, and we the, give some thickness and form the bones. And when we mix the bones and uh, muscles, we, uh, we give the shape with the skin and form the baby. If the baby will uh, prepared in intrauterine life, we give the some spirit, some uh, movement in 18 to 22 weeks, which have is FSH, means a, a fetal heart sound. Means ki that thing is a sound, the movement 
is uh, given by the God, it is a scientific or also is a nature. So, so we have the spirit is uh, under our uh, new nets or infants are also uh, human. So that thing, that uh, spirit will be provided by the external means uh, oxygen is a nasim according to Arabic Hawaii Mustanshik for the support and for the predisposing factor which have supported to the uh, ruh means spirit if we have not the oxygen or nasim on the environment we feel some weakness in the ruh and uh, ruh means ruh hawani ruh nafsani and ruh tabaiya if we have uh, seen the absent of the nasim that ruh will be weak and we feel hypoxia so when god created the humans something is a requirement is a nasim or spirit uh, or ruh will be provided to the, uh, circulated to the whole body is required a humors. Means humoral therapy according to Siddha, uh, Tri Dosha, uh, Vat Pitta Kapha. In our Yunani system of medicine, Dam Balgam Safra Soda means blood, yellow bile, black bile and uh, phlegm is a four humoral therapies, hum humors is a, for the growth, development and maintenance of the body. If anyone, uh, if we, uh, all are in equilibrium, when we have feel healthy. If anyone is increased in a uh, ratio, we have some diseases just like uh, Amraza Balgamia is a phlegmatic disease, Amraza Damvia is a sanguineous disease, Amraza Safravia is a bilious, bilious disease, or if uh, Amraza Saudavia is a sang, uh, melancholic disease. So four disease, if uh, we diagnose that, that person who have uh, some um, um, extra uh, formation of the material, that material is a uh, humus, that thing is a uh, morbid material. After that, we diagnose his temperament with the pulse, with the ball, with the barrage, means examination of the pulse, examination of the urine, and examination of the uh, stool. After that, we diagnose that persons who have a disease, is a phlegmatic disease, just like uh, we entered in the winter session. Uh, most of the patient having in, in the, uh, that uh, session, some cold and throat irritation, hoarseness of voice, and fever means we have some cold having cold exposure some changes means here we involve the phlegm in that uh, condition in condition when involved the phlegm means a phlegmatic disease we have a cold and cough throat irritation hoarseness of voice and fever is a phlegmatic condition there in unani system of medicine we have opposite treatment means um, a large visit a large visit in condition i want to know if a patient having anyone in the cold and cough or then we take uh, any cold diet no we take some hot some cold coffee some lukewarm water some uh, cold, uh, hot diet and some hot medicine in our system uh, some medicines we have just like uh, uh, just Timodhu in a Slusus or just Vasukpata is a Barge Arusa, Vesaka the Toda, also Glacirasa and Glabra, is both our medicines, is the hot and dry in second stage. Then we give the patient to take this medicine and patient having relief. In the, uh, I have note, sorry for the, <laughs> too long. So thank you very much. Uh, Yunani and Ayurveda is a nothing, uh, is a two minute, five minute, ten minute, or one hour, is a broad, it's a, uh, attached with the God, attached with the universe, attached with the globe. So, so the more we time we have, uh, more time. Thank you very much, sir. <coughs> so, thank you, Professor uh, Dennis Jaffer, for your nice discussion to bring or to show the connect between the concepts of Unani and Ayurveda. And it is interesting that Unani basically 
proposed proponent of Yunani is the Hippocrates. Hippocrates was the father of the modern medicine also. So it's a nice diversification of the medical concepts from its very origin. Now <coughs> we are inviting uh, Professor Orno Rai, Department of Sallatantra from J.B. Rai State Ayurvedic Medical College, Hospital Kolkata, it's the oldest Ayurvedic hospital and medical college in India. And uh, Professor Arnav Rai will discuss about the challenges in Ayurvedic surgical practices. So I'm requesting Professor uh, Arnav to discuss it in brief. Thank you, sir. Initially, I prepared the slide for the presentation of 6.66 uh, minutes. Now, um, uh, I'll have to uh, concise the, that matter also. The, um, I, I uh, belong to the, I'm a member of, uh, you know, the rarest, probably rare breed of Ayurved in West Bengal, Ayurvedic surgeon. Now, the thing is that I'll be discussing some of the issues. I'll just raise the I'll just raise some issues. I'll not discuss the constraints and solutions in detail because uh, because of the constraint of time, it is not possible. The thing is that the main issue is this. I operated a patient named Sushrut. He didn't know that there is evi uh, evidence of surgery in Ayurveda. The Ashtanga Ayurveda term is uh, known to everybody, but the people doesn't know there is evidence of surgery, there is existence of surgery in Ayurveda. Lack of public awareness is the main issue. We need to give wide publicity, we need to stop negative propaganda, we need to be involved in ethical practice. I need to introduce myself with, uh, with uh, Ayurvedic surgeon, it's like that. And we stop claiming tall claims and tall uh, treatment uh, in, you know, you know, the outcomes. The second thing is capacity building. We need to build ourselves. We need to train ourselves. There are different, in Shastras, you'll be getting information that you need to be equally competent in theory and practical trainings and all these things. This is happening nowadays in most of the Ayurvedic colleges. And uh, we need more practical trainings now. And the uh, you know training modality is not homogeneous in all the Ayurvedic uh, you know, institutes uh, in the state. Uh, in the country itself and uh, we need more exposure to the patient. More we'll see, more he'll observe, more he'll uh, perform, more competent we will be. So these are the um, uh, modality, uh, you know, uh, solution methods, I guess, frequent reorientation programs are to be, uh, you know, organized after, for the purpose of enhancing knowledge after getting the qualification. Hands-on training and workshops are to be increased and fellowship programs should be started. So fellowship programs are required for enhancing the knowledge and capacity building of the Ayurvedic surgeons. Next issue is where, where will you do surgery? Where will you operate? The infrastructure. The infrastructures are inadequate in, uh, uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, Ayurvedic medical establishments, uh, they are there in government and uh, private facilities, but we require, we need more. Mostly we concentrate on the, uh, uh, some hospitals are there attached with the colleges and all these things, but the, we concentrate on the minimal uh, standard requirement, okay, minimal MSR. We are concentrating on the MSR. It is included in the MSR, okay, buy it. If it is not included in the uh, MSR, okay, leave it, we'll buy it later. So we are not giving priority to the, to the instruments required for, um, you know, for improvement of the science. For the purpose of the education also, we require modern modalities, modern instruments. So we are not concentrating on that right now. Probably, and, and this is not the uh, universal scenario, but in limited, uh, uh, it's a limited situation. So we need to concentrate on, on uh, deficiency of uh, instruments. We need to uh, think of it because the modern surgeries are into, uh, instrument dependent. More Ayurvedic hospitals and uh, are to be established at government and NGO level. Three-tier Ayurvedic infrastructures are to be developed. What is three-tier? The referral system should be developed. Primary, secondary, and tertiary level Ayurvedic hospitals are to be developed. Next issue is 
integra integrated treatment. So in your in Ayurvedic surgery is always integrated. Because you are, I am an Ayurvedic doctor, I am operating, my anesthesiologist is giving anesthesia, so it's already integrated. So there is no issue with the integration, it's already integrated, but the thing is that legal issues, there are numerous other legal issues and the acceptance in the different medical communities. Uh, so this is a, a mindset we need to change. You know, uh, the, when, when we are saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, it is scientific. It is considered as scientific. When we see, uh, we say in Devanagari, 2 plus 2 uh, or 2, 4 hota hai, so we are considering it as uh, unscientific. So this is the issue we are facing nowadays, yes. The thing is that, uh, you know, no, uh, uh, next, uh, medical insurance. This is uh, issue number five. I'll be uh, raising two more issues. Uh, within two minutes, I'll be covering, I guess, medical insurance. The medical insurance is very clear. IRDI guidelines are very clear. But the thing is that unpredictable behavior of the insure, insure, uh, you know, insuring authorities. One company reputed the claim with a, with a statement that Ayurvedic doctor performing surgery in allopathic facility. Unethical practice. Uh, out of jurisdiction practice. These are the statements they are saying. But the other company settles the same claim with the same condition. So this is what I call unpredictable behavior. The guideline of IRDI is very clear. We need to establish more Ayurvedic infrastructures for daycare facility, for the host, uh, you know, indoor facility. The even a uh, daycare facilities and five bedded Ayurvedic hospitals are covering under insurance. Uh, this is a good uh, gesture. No, and uh, we need to concentrate on this Ayur developing Ayurvedic infrastructures. Government policies are again menace. You know, uh, Ayurvedic doctors can perform Ayurvedic surgery. There is an order. Ayurvedic doctors can perform Ayurvedic surgery. Now, what is the definition of Ayurvedic surgery? You are doing uh, incision and drainage. I will say it Vedan Karma and Vishravan Karma in Vidradi. You are say, uh, saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, you are strapping uh, granulation tissue. I'll say I'm doing Lekhan Karma. You are suturing the wound. I'll say I'll, I'm doing, uh, you know, C1 Karma. So what is the definition of Ayurvedic surgery? There is no, uh, there is no such definition. Wait, but yet, there is an order that uh, these, are the, these are the surgeries an Ayurvedic doctor can perform. There is an order. But again, you have another order that you cannot advise medical, uh, you know, injections, IV fluids and uh, blood transfusions like that. This is not the scenario of all, you know, in, in, whole, in the whole, in whole, whole country, but in limited states, these type of instructions are there. I will prepare a patient with a, uh, uh, for the purpose of surgery, and I will refer the patient to some other specialty that Dr. Saab, aap mujhe thoda titanus toxide liye, de, 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 mein de nahi sakta. Dr. Saab, ye blood transfusion jarurat hai, yo mein de nahi sakta, thoda aap karwa dijiye. It will invite more medical legal issues. We'll, so we need to think of, uh, you know, policy decisions. These are to be considered with uh, uh, technical persons. Next is uh, last issue. The industry academia collaboration, you know, the industry doesn't know what an Ayurvedic uh, surgeon requires. And I, I, I failed to convey the industry that what I require. I require a spray for antiseptic purpose, but industry doesn't recognize it. They don't have. I require an ointment for the purpose of fissure, but the industry has got an uh, ointment which is universally applicable in piles, fissure, and fistula, though they are of different, com complete different duty of pathogenesis. So we need to uh, think of it when uh, uh, some demand issues are also there. Industry, academia, meet and research collaborations. These are the probably the uh, you know can, can solve the problem. Thank you very much. Thanks to Professor Arnabre for his nice observation and the problems he has identified for the better practice and the practice to help the sufferers. Now, through discussion, we have understood that, yes, Ayurveda has definite basis, conceptual basis, theoretical basis, practical basis, evidences are there. Now, more evidences we have to bring, we have to reveal, we have to establish. So, in establishing evidences, multimodal imaging, sensing, spectroscopy play the big role. So, I am requesting 
Professor Soman Das, the Chairman of School of Medical Science and Technology IIT Kharagpur and also the Acting Dean of Medical Science IIT, upcoming Medical College of IIT Kharagpur. He is also very eminent expert in the field of medical sensors using MEMS and NEMS technology. So I am requesting Professor Das to say a few words or a brief introduction on the application of the sensors uh, in advancing the cause of Ayurveda. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Chatterjee, and good afternoon, you all. We, I'll be very short, although my presentation is very big, but it'll be very short because all of us are now waiting for the Sattvic uh, lunch. Uh, I'll not take much time. Uh, first of all, it is uh, uh, topic name is the role of micro nanotechnology in advancing the Ayurveda. Rather, uh, I'll, I'll take it as a leveraging the state of the technology for advancing the Ayurveda. That should be the topic. Okay, what uh, the today's uh, state of the technologies, can I take it for the advancement of the uh, Ayurveda? And uh, my domain is your uh, micro nanotechnology, bio sensing part. So I'll just uh, put a few of the things out of this bio sensing to move forward. Uh, today, uh, can I take the Ayurveda? Can you allow me to take a uh, robotic controlled uh, remote? Uh, uh, remote operation, whether the patient will be in the remote and the Ayurvedic doctor will be in the other place and to do the operation by the robotic control. So you can now understand how much technology intervention is there, is required. This technology is now available globally. Okay. Although may not be in our country, it is not that much, but abroad it is available, okay? So, I have to see in that perspective, okay? So with this, just quickly I will go through. Uh, we, uh, yes, we all respect that it is Ayurveda is a ancient Indian traditional system of medicine I used to take at the system level. Yes, it is proved. Ayurveda will, will uh, cure my, my whole system. It is a system level approach. Okay. Today uh, morning, uh, Professor Joyce has told, Professor Gayatri Mukherjee also mentioned the reductionist it is not that approach. Yes, people have understand, people acknowledge that. On the other side, Professor Somesh Kumar told that from the, uh, 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 your side, Ayurvedic side, we have to uh, uh, go for a uh, statistical analysis. Although I know that at least in our institute or in the other uh, institute, uh, students are working but that is a piecemeal wise. The nanotechnology, chemistry department, material science department, physics department, they are working. Uh, having uh, some uh, Ayurvedic medicine, developing the carrier for, uh, to, to deliver the drug at the atomic uh, cellular level. Okay, they are working, but we take it as a as a nanotechnology, we take it as a chemistry, all this part. At here, in the Ayurveda, yes, it is also a part of the Ayurveda. Our ex-student yesterday, she has already uh, given a talk on the honey, uh, where I, I must acknowledge that Professor Chatterjee, Professor Jyotirmoy Chatterjee is an iconic figure in India who has carried out this honey-based uh, uh, research over the decades. 
we must acknowledge that. So having uh, all these issues, we require the validation, of course. And that validation, one side you have a mathematics, analytical validation, another side, it is that you take the leverage of the technology. And there you can consider the nanobiotechnology. Okay, why nano or micro technology? Because there is a similarity in the size. Whatever we are treating at the cellular level or subcellular level, it is the uh, uh, so biomolecule one side which will interact at the uh, cell membrane or is diffusing into the cell, they have a similarity in size altogether. So it is a science, but we should have a scientific validation. Now, uh, coming to my domain, what is the micro nano? Here are just several examples I have given where you can see that uh, a very small in the submicron level, a camel has been prepared using the gold foil. It is by the laser micromachining technique. It is a submicron uh, size and the image is taken by the electron microscopy. Okay. Moving forward uh, in the right hand uh, one, uh, it is a array of micro needle. Array of micro needle. We require a needle for de delivering the drug vaccine. And that actually peers through our dermal level reaching to the blood vessel. Uh, but now uh, it has some uh, advantage and also has some disadvantage. Now with the micro nanotechnology, we can develop a array of needle. It is the composition is your biomaterial. And that a patch of the needle can be placed on the, on the skin. And by the biodegradation process, the drug can be delivered into the skin or into the blood vessel. So I can take the help of the technology for making this kind of devices for easy delivery of the drug. And uh, some other pictures, I'll uh, just rapidly I'll go through. And along with that, you have a nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is a bottom-up approach. From the atomic scale, you are developing your whole uh, or macro module or the uh, devices. Whereas in the other side, you also have a top-down approach where you take a bulk of the material and you are shaping it to get at, a, at the micro scale level. So that is the nanotechnology. Uh, in the nanotechnology or nanoscience, various kinds of carriers can be, can be synthesized. And at the nanoscale, the advantage is that the surface area is much more compared to volume. Okay. And that is the, uh, uh, where at the surface, as it is much more exposed, so a lot of biomolecules can be tacked there and it can easily go as a carrier, drug carrier. That is the advantage, okay. Just taking a herbal medicine, uh, 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 instead of that, I can take it in a, uh, or coat, it, coat my herbal uh, medicine on the uh, nano carriers. Most of the herbal drugs are uh, not, uh, uh, not very much soluble in the aqua solution. So I can take a, I can design a carrier. And in the carrier should be very small in size. So that the total surface area increases and the uh, drug molecule can be attached there. And then I can take it and uh, show that the uh, uh, proper dose can be delivered at the cellular level. Uh, so here are some of the things now. Some activities can be taken up. One, two examples I will just give it to you. As I was thinking, because I have not worked in the, uh, this Ayurveda site. I understand that you use the several hundreds of the leaves. Today morning I have, uh, I attended that lecture. How can I know this leaves belongs to this, for this medicine? from my experience, as I understand, as a layman, is it not? Or by some characteristics. But I can take it, uh, the, the advantage of the technology, 
I can develop a E nose, electronic nose, or a E tongue I can develop for the testing purpose. Uh, this is the sensing part. Okay. And I can I can Id identify this list belongs to what? Okay. Uh, this is the one part. Another uh, example uh, giving that I'll finish it. Here, it is a microfluidics again, and many of the times the uh, different component has to be uh, uh, synthesized or it has to be filtered out. Just here I have given you alkaloids uses, uh, use as a anesthetic, cardioprotective, anti-inflammatory uh, agent, and which is extracted from the tree, uh, tree leaves. But the extraction process, which is a conventional, traditional process, but it takes time, and it's a lengthy process, and it may not go up to the highest purity level. But using the microfluidic channel, it is just a, a, a channel, parallel channel, you can make it, and you flow your samples along with the formic acid in the uh, 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 and the other other aqueous phase parallelly together as there is a microfluidic channel so here the science is that it will be in the laminar flow flow will be there it will not mix up because of the laminar flow as it goes but the molecules it will be segregated by the diffusion process so here it is the science I can take the advantage of that while the, all the fluids in the liquid phase, it will move from inlet to outlet, they will not mix up, but the extraction can be done, extraction of the molecules can be taken up by the diffusion process and it will be very, very pure, very much pure. So these are the some glimpses, here uh, we develop some of the uh, microfluidic challenges using the uh, leaf standard leaf, we took it and make that uh, channels channels and in a, in a polymer material and these are the uh, ex vivo or in vitro modeling to see or uh, to, to design the, the cardiovascular network. And in this channel, I can put the the, I can flow the, uh, your, your fluid along with the drug and I can see what is the efficacy of the drug. Instead of using the animal model, which is a destructive model, but I can use this kind of platform in my lab to see the efficacy. Okay, so with this I will complete and I can uh, uh, say that at the, at the last, a uh, lot of opportunities for establishing the Ayurveda by leveraging the modern science knowledge, specifically the micro nanotechnology, and the scientific validation for the global acceptance. And today morning, we have say, we heard about the Professor uh, Somesh Kumar's lecture, the statistical validation is very much required. Then only the paper, my work will be accepted by the International Journal, ACI Index Journal. With this, I, I thank you very much. Thanks to Professor Soman Das for his nice <coughs> discussion in the field of application of nano technology, nanobiotechnology or the sensor technology in mimicking the systems. People are now working for lab on chip, cell on a chip, organ on a chip, body on a chip. So they are trying to understand the system. System has the structure, system has the function, system has the intelligence, system has the emotions, and emotions to know the unknown. People may say the knowing the unknown, the emotion for knowing the unknown may be the spirituality also. So knowing the unknown and to establish the fact with more evidences, our challenges to make our our Ayurveda, the science of life, applicable for all sorts of diseases. And it will develop friendship with all sciences, with all medicines in the universe. 
that is our desire, that is our <coughs> endeavor. So now, Dr. Sumit Sur, the Ayurveda medical officer, will slightly discuss about the multi ministerial activity to enhance the scope for Ayurveda in current era of India. So I'm requesting Dr. Sur to discuss in brief because we have to start our lunch at 1.30. You have less time, you have three more speakers. Yes. Namaskar. My subject is something different. We have under Ayurveda system is under Ayush Ministry. Through its national Ayush Ministry and state level, it is runs through district and block level. We have many more scope. Now it's collaborated with other ministry like Ministry of Rural Development and uh, Tribal Affairs also. But we have many scope like or uh, ministry ke saath hamara sambandh hai. Lekin hum log ka possibility nahi mil raha hai. To iske liye possibility kahan kahan hai. Mein chhe saath example ke saath aapke saamne rakhta hoon. Ministry of Health and Family Welfare runs about 20 national program. As per example, Rashtriya Balsastha Karjakram, where we have 20,000 Ayurveda doctors in the country, has no authorization to give medicine. But they are forwarding that patient to MBBS only. Number two, there is a program called Anemia Mukta Bharat, National Program for Iron Deficiency Anemia, where only iron content tablet is prescribed. In Ayurveda, separately, Pandu Rogadhyay, बहुत सारे स्कॉलर मेंशन करके गया और बहुत सारे मेडिसिंस लाइक स्वतापरी मंडूर पुनर्नवादी मंडूर मेंशन है हमारे इंक्लूसन होना चाहिए नंबर थ्री नेशनल मेंटल हेल्थ प्रोग्राम जहां पे ओनली एंटीसाइकोटिक ड्रग अलोंग हुई सत्ता वजह चिकित्सा आयुर्वेद जी मेंशन है साइकोथेरेपी ऑलरेडी गिवन बट इट शुड बी इंक्लूडेड विथ रसायन थेरेपी एंड पंचकर्म चिकित्सा ऑल्सो Others ministry, like Ministry of Women and Child Development, this way, ICDS program chalta hai, Integrated Child Development Scheme ke tarah, Anganwadi Center mein, 0 to 6 year ka, year ka bachcha ko, or pregnant lady ko, nutritional diet diya jata hai. But usko sikha nahi jata hai ki biruddha har kaise hai. Hamara ke paas incompatible diet ghar tak pounch gaya. Or bachcha ko, a food mein, Amla, Trico to like, Sunti, Pippoli and Golmorich add bhi hona chahiye. Hamar paas aur ek ministry hai, hum log thankful to Ministry of Culture, a total ayajan ke support dene ke liye sir saamne baitha hai. Ajadi ka Amrit Mahat Sabh mein hum log mila hai e program. Food culture, hamara desh mein, desh ka andar, hamara Bengal ka teis rajjo, jila hai, us mein andar hi food ka cultural variant alag alag hai. Lekin hum log do's or do not, फूड कल्चर के अच्छा ठीक कौन है हमारा भूल कौन है ये माना जाता है लेकिन उसके ऊपर चर्चा होना चाहिए थ्रू मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ कल्चर हमारा आयुर्वेद का प्रोग्राम में 75 फूड्स फेस्टिवल अरेंज किया गया है देश में और एक मिनिस्ट्री है मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एजुकेशन वी आर थैंकफुल टू आईआईटी खड़गपुर अंडर मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एजुकेशन जो ऑर्गेनाइज करने के लिए लेकिन हमारा देश में एक दो राज्य है जो प्राइमरी एजुकेशन लेवल में क्लास 3 टू क्लास 12 तक एजुकेशन सिस्टम में आयुर्वेद आना चाहिए और उसका प्रॉपरली स्कोरिंग सिस्टम भी होना चाहिए क्योंकि आयुर्वेद आज साइंस फैटर्निटी से आके जब कुछ मिल रहा है तो उसके बहुत सारे दिक्कत प्रॉब्लम भी आ रहा है और एक मिनिस्ट्री का मैटर है कि मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ टूरिज्म जहां पे थोड़ा सा हिंट सर के दिया कि मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ टूरिज्म देश में दो राज्यों केरला एंड उत्तराखंड उसका स्टेट लेवल में इंक्लूडेड है लेकिन आयुर्वेद मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ टूरिज्म में देश का नेशनल पॉलिसी में इंक्लूसन होना चाहिए सर जो बोला था कि हमारे पास इंश्योरेंस का मैटर है 2016 में मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ आयुष 27 कंपनी को इंश्योरेंस का मैटर छोड़ दिया लेकिन देश का मैक्सिमम राज्य में वो खत्म नहीं हुआ इसी थोड़ा सा मैं पांच छह मिनिस्ट्री का बात बोला और कुछ है टाइम कम है I will request Indian Knowledge System Unit to carry forward these things on behalf of this uh, Ayurved fraternity. We will thankful to you. Thank you.
thanks to dr sur for his nice uh, observations and suggestions to extend to expand to more more utilization of ayurvedic concepts in our daily life and also support from the ministries to enter to recognize the concept of ayurveda in the educational systems uh, now before lunch we have one speaker more uh, dr sanjeev kumar samanta the founder of the scientific ayurvedic care and research foundation of kolkata uh, he will talk about the contribution of marmotherapy in critical and complicated cases we know that in in china acupuncture and moxibustion has developed a lot in ayurveda we have the concepts of marmasthana and the dagdha chikitsa and it has strong parallel between acupuncture moxibustion and the marmasthan and the dagdha chikitsa and it has many many dimensions from the application point of view and the modern medicine <coughs> also finding the parallel in neurology we are getting the dry needling for neurological conditions electroceuticals in the modern elect combination of the knowledge of the electrical engineering electrotherapy and the medical sciences so here uh, professor samanto will slightly discuss about the utility of marmasthana in the management of complicated cases yes professor samanto namaskar in front of audience and in on the dais marmo and its contribution hmm. our ancient culture ayurveda enlighten the scientific manner of for health care which contributes fruitful result in global level nowadays there are significant changes in the thinking about the health problems at this stage various health programs are organized to keep society healthy at large scale physically mentally and spiritually swastha so swastha rakhanam atrosya vikaro prasamanunjo hence for prevention and to stay out from clinical and chronic diseases as well as to maintain positive health marmo shows a significant role in ayurveda let us know the about the marmo marmo are the vulnerable points or vital sensitive zones which gives pranic energy according to morsi sutra it is also known as jivan aadhar according to rigved these vital points are protected from injury marayati iti marmo as it is a sensible vital spot therefore those points are anatomically and physiologically are too active these spots have energetic force for healing action physically mentally and spiritually according to bhyatrai location function and application of therapies are done for self care to critical care to get better result in panchakarma kharsutra agni karma etc let me share with you some critical cases which i found miracle action in true marmo case number 1 one severe comatose patient aged about 70 years blood coagulation in brain treatment was done in arjikor medical college and hospital after 21 days scan report shows no improvement at all 
the refused patient sent to hospital um, home. I started treatment after 22 days. Mormotherapy and sirodhara was given. After three days, patient eyes were blinked. Patient gave response when bawling after four days and hand raised slightly. After seven days, again, brain CT scan showed all the clotted blood was abolished. The line of treatment, environment of room, moru massage, shirodhara, and bosti. Environment of room, here, normally, we, comatose patient and other patient, we use ICU bed or ITU, or, but here the normal weather. Normal weather means that is normal, about 30 to 32 degrees centigrade better. And music fitted in room. The music is always singing, ringing. And mormo massage. These special mormos are given massage in a special technique. And particularly in Odibosti. Odibosti, actually, these Odipoti mormos in head. This is a special mormo and massage is a special way. Then mormos, simonto mormo, odipati mormo, sthaponi mormo, sankho and krikatika. These mormo are massages with a medicated oil in a special technique. And this will give result easily. Then another one case, patient aged about 65 years, came severe, came with me, severe angina and three coronary artery blockage of 100%, 90% and 70%. He had anemia, HDN, hypertension, osteoarthritis and diabetes mellitus. Where Blood sugar fasting, 495. Hemoglobin level, 6.5 gram percent after two bottles blood transfusion. Patient was refused from Arjikar Medical College. Treatment started with mormotherapy and patient improved within seven days. After seven days, blood sugar level was 179 without insulin. Patient able for walking at a stage for 30 minutes. Patient was treated in 2015 July. Till now patient is steady, no angina, work at his home and at his farm. Here line of treatment was mormotherapy, hridhara, prolep and bosti. Mormotherapy The mormo therapy, here we give Kipro, Tolo Hidoi, Hidoi Mormo, and Ani, Kurpur, Janu Mormo. These Mormo are used for massage with a special oil, Ayurvedic oil, and Hidoi Dhara. Hidoi Dhara given on Hidoi Mormo with a decoction of herbs. And a bosti was given with medicated oil to reduce the blood sugar level. And some more massage also given for lowering the blood sugar level, particularly Ani, Janu, Kurpur. Another one case, one specialist government doctor, aged 36 years, came with severe cervical spondylitis and osteoarthritis with all joints, along with severe crackling sound in joint movement, profuse pain, IBS, anxiety, 
hyperacidity and insomnia, he attempted suicide three times. Here, every day, this doctor taken pandy four tablets a day with jealousy MPS one bottle per day. In such condition, he came to me. He was suffering from 10 years. After treatment with mormotherapy, along with Ayurvedic medicine, now he is better, IV is fully controlled, pain and crackling sound are subside, no drug taken for hyperacidity, anxiety, and insomnia. Here, message is given, Angso, Angso Falok. Angso, Angso Falok. Nitombo, Parsho Sundi, Kurpor, Janu, Gulfo, especially, and all other Mormos also. This is a very important case complicated case, this is improved and patient was treated about last eight months. I'm not getting too much time, I'm getting another one, I'm telling you another one case only. One lady patient, aged about 55 years, along with hypertension, IBS, osteoarthritis with palpitation and cough. It is a CKD patient, chronic kidney disease. His, my, her creatinine level 9.54 and urea was 280. She was under my treatment for last few years, a few years. And now the creatinine level is 3 and the Blood, uh, <coughs> urea is 70 and other conditions are normal, more or less normal. And here some special massages with Ayurvedic medicine is given. Here also we are giving here Nitombo, Ongso, Ani, Gulfo and Janu, Kurpur. These mormos are given lowering the kidney function development and as well as liver function and others nervous system on circulation also and this will giving the good result. Normally we think there is no treatment in critical care and Ayurveda, in critical care or complicated cases, no treatment in Ayurveda. Normally, we have things. But we are not getting the chance of to treat the critical cases because the popularity and publicity never comes present to us. But we are getting patient only the refuse cases from hospitals and lowering economy, lower economy level. Naturally, if let us work together to bring of Ayurveda in front line consciousness so that while in danger or accidental cases, Ayurveda come in front line. Wishing you all Sukhayu, Hitayu and Dirgayu. Thanks to Professor Samanto. Professor Samanto for his nice elaboration, uh, application of Marmostan Chikisha 
as I told that it has nice connotation with acupuncture, moxibustion, marmasthan, and we have in Indian context in Ayurveda, there is a concept of 107 marmasthan. In acupuncture, there is 348 muspali or maybe more, but they have strong parallel, strong connotation concept-wise, application-wise. So Ayurveda and Traditional Chinese medicine, the acupuncture has strong association, connotation, and application-wise, we can assimilate so many things for the in the context of integration of medicine. Now we have to go for lunch. Before lunch, we'll felicitate the uh, panelist or our speakers. I'll, I'll the yes, Professor is there. So may I call upon Professor Joy Sain uh, to felicitate the panelists. So we had great, uh, uh, great discussions today, and uh, perhaps each discussion was worth listening for at least for an hour. But due to constraints of time, so I request Dr. Sain to uh, Professor Sain to uh, felici felicitate uh, Professor Gayatri Mukherjee, Madam. Okay, here, we can start here also, it's, it's not a problem. <laughs> Professor Shantanu Dhara. Professor, Professor Arnav Ray. <laughs> Professor Somen Das. So all of us, please uh, give a big applause to make this event happening. Please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words of, and blessings. Actually, it was the silent support of Professor Das also, I mean, continuous, uninterrupted, from, from our medical school, and also he's one of our deans. Dr. Sumit Sur. Sanjeev Kumar Samanta.
So with this ends a very interesting panel discussion and uh, now we are breaking for lunch. But again, post lunch, there are some very interesting uh, workshops and some very interesting talks. So I request all the delegates to try and be back by 2.15 and uh, so that we can uh, quickly uh, start with the proceedings of this uh, further part of the Ayurdhara and uh, which will go on up to around 4.30 or 5 o'clock.